So we're going to be looking at, I'm going to be able to kind of squeeze, squeeze through, breeze through some of these topics because I think these are topics that you guys can read on your own. But with the cardio, uh, cardiovascular system, the last thing we talked about, we talked about the blood, we talked about the heart. We need to now talk about the vessels. So everything that we've been talking about in a heart lecture, we started to uh, talk more about the preload and afterload. And those are principles that we, in order to us, for us to fully understand, we do have to look at how the vessels are uh, able to accommodate. So we want to be able to look at the sympathetic, the autonomic uh, effects of the parasympathetic and sympathetic pathways on the vessels themselves. So looking at that, uh, again, some of the things I'm going to kind of breeze through are arteries and veins. Uh, arteries carry blood away from the heart, as we described. Veins carrying blood back to the heart. And then the next slide over is one of my favorite slides. Again, from the Body World exhibit. Anybody get the chance to go to the Body World exhibit yet? Oh, yeah. No, it's uh, February. February, until February. Don't miss out on that. Great place to go to if you if you go if you went. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you went to both both you went to the top floor too, right? Yeah. 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 So you get you get to see some really cool stuff there. Um, something you might not be able to see in LA for another ten years. So take advantage of it. This is one of the exhibits where they showed all the capillaries. So what Dr. Gunther, Gunther von Hagen was able to do, or probably one of his anatomists, was basically be able to strip away all of the tissue surrounding the blood vessels. So he's able to pump that, that, that uh, liquid polymer throughout, have it pump all the way through the heart, uh, through all the major areas, and then you can see the areas that are all filled out are all the capillaries. Um, and I know capillaries uh, are, are very, very small vessels, so he probably wasn't able to get most of the capillaries, but at least you can still see the dense capillary beds. And looking at all that, there's not, any muscle tissue, there's no collagen, there's no bone. This is purely just the capillaries that you can see. So all the major vessels you can see, you can see the kidneys, you can see the, uh, the aorta, the heart itself, um, everything else. So the capillaries that we're gonna be working at, we'll see that are the areas that are gonna be the thinnest vessels. And these are gonna contain about 60,000 miles. If you were to take out those capillaries and string them out one by one, that's about 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels. And those are all the red blood, red blood cells that are capable of flowing through those capillaries in order to assist in or to, to be responsible for gas exchange. This is where we can see O2, CO2 exchange that takes place, whether up in the lungs or down to the actual tissues themselves. We'll be able to explore that concept during this lecture. Uh, looking at the vessels, we go from arteries we branch them uh, out to the types of arteries based on their makeup. Uh, elastic arteries and distributing arteries, which we'll discuss. Arterioles, which will branch from the arteries. Arterioles down into the capillaries. Capillaries where exchange is going to take place. These vessels are our thinnest vessels where we can see uh, nutrient exchange. We see fluid moving in and out of the capillaries. We see, uh, we see hormones. We see everything that, 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 that moves in and out of the blood. Venules are going to be, the capillaries are going to converge back into the venules. Venules are going to move back into the veins. Veins are going to carry blood back towards the heart. We've got two anatomical structures to talk about, anastomoses as well as portal veins, which we discussed in our endocrine lecture. The uh, next thing to take a look at are the vessel structure and function. This I'm not going to spend too much time on, but nonetheless, this is going to still describe the different layers of the vessels. You've got the tunica interna, which is going to be the internal, the tunica media, which is going to be the middle, and the tunica external, which is going to contain the, uh, the collagen on the outside. We'll be able to see that on the next slides over. Tunica ex interna is going to be the side that is uh, exposed to the blood itself. So blood that flows through is going to be exposed to the internal ep uh, epithelial layer, which we refer to as the endothelium. Uh, the endothelium, you can see, is, um, uh, allows the stuff to move in and out, the ions, the gases, and nutrients. So uh, keep that in mind when we look at the tunica internal later. The tunica media is mostly muscle. And the muscle that surrounds the vessel is gonna, uh, what's going to take place <coughs> that's going to allow for vasodilation and vasoconstriction. These smooth muscles, 
allow for the different diameter of the vessels to, to allow blood to flow in and out of. So we have the ability to be able to vasodilate or vasoconstrict to allow either blood to, to allow more blood to flow in or less blood to flow in. And that should start to tie in. When we're thinking about vasodilation and vasoconstriction, think about what happens when we describe uh, sympathetic activities. So if you're going to start running or you're gonna do anything that involves increased uh, sympathetic output, you're gonna to want to redirect blood to areas that are critical. You want to bring more blood into the, to, to the muscles. You want to redirect blood away from things like the gastrointestinal system. So we have to find ways to be able to redirect blood to uh, our essential tissues. Now the tunica externa is really just the collagenous uh, fibers on the outside. It's just all it is, it's just anchoring things to surrounding tissues. Now when we move from the arteries to the arterioles, to the capillary bed, to the venules, back to the veins, we'll be able to look at the differences in the structure of the tunica externa media and uh, ex tunica externa, tunica media, and tunica interna. One thing I want to point out is the cross sectional area. If you were to take a slice of the arterioles, you can see what the slice would look like in terms of the cross sectional area. How much blood can flow through this area versus the capillaries. If I were to cut through all the capillaries, you'll see that there's an increased cross-sectional area. That means that blood, if you're red blood cells, you might have a bigger arteriole, you're flowing through one arteriole, as opposed to all the different capillaries. You've split that, the different areas that blood can start to flow out through. And effectively, what that's gonna do, when you increase cross-sectional area, you're going to slow the blood flow through that area. Imagine you're now a blood, red blood cell, you can route through different areas. As you move through this way, you see that it travels even slower. If you're able to look at geography, this will be the difference of looking at uh, a creek. And if you've got a narrow creek, you can see water flowing fairly quickly. But then as it starts to spread out through, um, um, I don't even know what the am clearly not into geography. Um, but if you take a look at the streams when they start to split up, you can see that, that the water moves very slowly through those areas until they converge back into that creek where it starts to flow back faster. And that should make sense. Why we want to start to decrease flow through this area is to allow those red blood cells as they move through the capillaries. Remember, in our blood lecture, I showed you an image of a red blood cell squeezing through a capillary. We want to slow this area to allow gas exchange to occur, and then the blood starts to, to speed up as we move from the venules back over to the vein. Again, our capillaries are going to show you the, more, the thinnest type of cells, uh, thinnest type of vessels, which are going to be just our endothelium. Now as we move through, uh, let's take a look at the different vessels. The elastic arteries are going to be important. Uh, the elastic arteries, um, the, the main characteristic of elastic arteries is that they're, they're thinner, thinner walls, but they're the largest, they have the largest diameter. So the whole thing behind elastic arteries, they are elastic by nature. They want to be able to stretch, and just like a water balloon, they want to be able to stretch and be able to push blood through. So the whole purpose of elastic arteries is to basically take the mechanical energy of blood being pushed into that area. And the first thing I want you guys to think about is the structure of the aorta. As blood leaves the left ventricle and pushes into the aorta, the aorta stretches out. And it's stretchy because of the elastic, uh, the, the collagen and elastin that surrounds the tunica, uh, tunica media. It stretches out. Okay, and I'll be able to show you that on the next slide over. And what it does when the, uh, when the, aorta, when the aorta stretches out after uh, ventricular systole, it stretches out and then during ventricular diastole, now that the aorta stretched out, it's still gonna continually squeeze. So that should mean that there's always a certain amount of pressure when you fill up that aorta and then when, during ventricular diastole, it's still continually squeezing. And why do we want that? And that's the, the reason we want that is we want continually blood, continual blood flow to move out through the aorta. The other portion is that the first branch out of the aorta is the coronary artery. So this coronary artery has to continually feed oxygenated blood 
to the heart. So as long as there's a pressure during ventricular diastole, and that pressure is about 80 millimeters of mercury, there's still continually blood flow, even though the heart is in the middle of pumps. So pump once, blood flows out. Heart relaxes, and blood is still flowing through the, through the springiness of that elastic artery. Now, distributing arteries do exactly that. They just distribute blood through. They're gonna route that over to uh, one area to the next. And a good example of uh, these are just any of your arteries. And um, what's the describing factor of these is that they have more smooth muscle, so they can do a lot more vasodilation and vasoconstriction. This whole process of vasodilation and vasoconstriction is what we call vascular tone. What is the strength at which we're uh, squeezing the smooth muscle around those vessels will allow us to determine how much blood flow is being sent to that tissue bed. So this is our way of being able to distribute blood to the critical organs and redirect blood away from areas that we need less. An idea that we'll call uh, later on, we call shunting of blood. If I have high sympathetic output or uh, there's ink, um, if, I've got, if I need to redirect blood to the brain and the lungs and, and, the, and the muscles, I want to be able to deliver more blood to those areas and deliver less blood to areas that need it less, such as uh, our, our small intestine, our stomach, and so forth. Arterioles, we're going from our arteries now to our arteriole. And the arteriole, when we look at the arteriole, is to basically feed blood into the capillary bed. So the, the area that we're looking at is the, is the from the arterial to the capillary bed that we want to work on is called the met arterial. It's, it's basically right after the arterial. This is the branch that we're looking at. So if this is the arterial, this is our venule, this is the capillary bed that leads into. Now the important part of the met arterial, which I described over on the next slide over, is that there's regulation of blood flow into this area. This basically this met arterial serves as a nozzle. And you can see that, especially on uh, the, what are called precapillary sphincters. These precapillary sphincters are the sphincters that wrap around between the met arterial and the capillaries themselves. And those nozzles work to basically e either turn off or turn on the amount of muscle tone in that area to either direct more blood in or shunt blood away. So the thing about their precapillary sphincters that I'll describe later on uh, on the next slide over, is that they are not autonomically regulated, meaning there's no uh, parasympathetic fibers or sympathetic fibers that lead into this area. It's completely automatic, and it's all regulated based on the amount of hormones as well as gases in that area. So the way this is going to work, here you can see our, our capillary bed, you see the met arterial that branches off the arterial, and the precapillary sphincters that govern the connection between the met arterial as well as the capillary bed. Now, what happens when the precapillary sphincters are relaxed? That allows blood flow through. It's a ring that wraps around and it's relaxed. Blood can flow through naturally and, 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 and supply blood to the entire capillary bed. Now, if we don't want blood into that area, we can now contract, it's a sphincter that we can contract to, to prevent blood from flowing through. Now what that's going to do effectively is redirect blood through the met arterial back to the venule and none of this blood is going to, uh, to be used for oxygenating any of the tissue beds. So this area could be, let's say, the stomach or this could be the small intestines during exercise. We want to redirect blood away from that area and reserve that precious blood, that cardiac output for areas that are in need of uh, blood. We want to deliver more oxygen to active tissues, to the less, less to the non-important uh, tissues. Uh, looking at that, um, some of the things that we mentioned like hormones are nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator. And that vasodilation takes place 
right on those precapillary sphincters. That allows more blood to flow to those areas as opposed to areas that we do not want uh, to run. Um, this is an example of shunting, as I mentioned earlier. Now we get re blood <laughs> redirected away from that capillary bed and back, back into our venous system. So the capillaries. Again, capillaries are highly branched. They're a very small diameter, about five to 10 micrometers. And that allows our red blood cells to flow single file. And that, as I mentioned earlier, our capillaries are highly branched. We have an increased cross-sectional area, meaning more areas, more pathways that the blood can follow. That effectively allows the blood to slow down to allow for proper gas exchange to take place. So when we look at our capillaries, capillaries flow through almost every cell in the body itself. So every cell that's close to a capillary will have adequate nutrients Ad adequate gas exchange that takes place to replenish that extracellular fluid. That's what we want. We want to be able to uh, remove anything out. If I've got a cell nearby, the ECF would be all the fluid outside of the cell, which would be the interstitial fluid surrounding, and that's the interstitial fluid around it, as well as the blood surrounding that area. So those capillaries that, that, that come in and feed the, the nearby cells will come in and remove any excess CO2. They'll remove any excess lactic acid. They'll come in and they'll replenish and deliver fresh O2 in order to keep cellular respiration taking place with, with those tissues. Now that should make sense if this were an active, if this were a muscle bed uh, supplied by this capillary bed. That muscle bed that's being continually active is gonna generate metabolic byproducts that should get picked up by the capillaries and that the, the fresh oxygen coming in through will come in and I'll try the freshly oxygenated blood will deliver fresh oxygen to those tissues as well. What we'll focus on towards the end of this lecture is how the red blood cells unload that oxygen and pick up CO2. We're just talking about the pathway, the, the highways and pathways that lead to those cells. So the, the main idea behind all of these capillaries is that they are exchange vessels because this is the only place where gas exchange is gonna take place, specifically in the capillary bed. Everything else that we've been able to see, arterioles, our distributing arteries, the, uh, the, the elastic arteries, even the heart itself. The whole purpose of that is just to deliver blood through. But where we want actually gas exchange to take place, in the capillaries. Now, looking at that, we have three types of capillaries. We have continuous capillaries, if you look at continuous capillaries, these are basically your, epi uh, your endothelium cells that are all branched together. They've got anchoring junctions that hold them together. Um, we do have some intracellular clefts, which are basically the, the, the junctions in between cells. And that allows for things to leak in and out, to leak in and out of the cell themselves. Now, we're going to have other capillaries with bigger windows, windows which we call fenestra, fenestra for fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrated capillaries are much more porous. They have holes in them that allow larger molecules to flow through. Maybe things like proteins that need to leave out through those pores. They're big enough to allow bigger molecules to leave, but they still only keep the red blood cells and other of the formed elements to stay within, okay? Now looking at the other, the last of them, is the really like the Swiss cheese of capillaries. Mm -hmm. These are sinusoids, and sinusoids have even bigger holes. And the whole purpose of these sinusoids are to allow the formed elements to move through. Now, why would we want the formed elements to leave the blood? Well, because red blood cells don't live very long. They have about 120 days they can live. After that, they die. So we need to get rid of these de uh, dead red blood cells, and we need to put in new red blood cells. Where does that take place? Again, the quiz question I asked you guys, where do we put in... Uh, where do we get the stem cells from? Stem cells in the bone marrow. So naturally, in the bone marrow, we're going to have sinusoid capillaries. As those stem cells differentiate and become red blood cells or white blood cells or platelets, they'll flow through the sinusoids. Well, or they can enter the circulation. When these red blood cells are done, they're going to get turned into bilirubin in the liver. They're going to get chopped up and used for something else. So sinusoids are going to be present in the liver to allow cells to leave the circulatory system. Now, venules are going to be uh, basically the uh, veins uh, that, that 
leave the capillary vent. And all they do is they basically drain fluid back into the venule. So looking at that, this uh, where we're gonna see our venules, venules are gonna be where we're gonna see most of the blood being stored. If you were to take a look at your blood right now, where most of that blood is stored, stored in your veins. Veins basically returning blood back. If you were looking at the veins, they're much thinner, uh, less muscle, uh, low intravenous pressure. Another characteristic of veins is they're gonna contain flaps, and I'll talk about that on the next slide over. But where most of the blood is stored, out of this entire pie, pie chart, at any given point in time, 7% of your blood is in your heart. 7% in your systemic capillaries. 9% in your pulmonary vessels. The rest of the blood is pulled away in your veins and venules. So that's where you store your blood. Okay? And it's not technically being stored, it's where your blood spends most of its time. Now if we need to tap into and bring more blood into the capillaries, well, that's where the systemic <laughs> effect is gonna have a role in this area. We want to, if I got a water balloon, I guess that water balloon in this case would be our veins. If, that, if, if our veins are holding that blood, we can do something where we can squeeze those veins a little bit to bring blood back into the heart. That bringing the blood back into the heart is what we call preload, right? So one way of squeezing that blood back is something we call veno constriction. Squeeze those veins and return blood back to the heart. And how do we do that? How do we prevent vein, uh, blood in the veins from moving back in the wrong direction? Well, this is where those valves come in. And the way these valves work, if you were to take a look at the tunica interna, we have these flaps of epithelial tissue that come together. And that allows for unidirectional blood flow through the vein. So taking a look at the leg, for instance, blood is supposed to flow back up towards the heart. You ever, if you ever wonder, how, do, how does blood in the leg make its way all the way back up the heart against gravity? Well, that's where our veins work together. So we'll talk about in, the, uh, in, in I believe, uh, on Tuesday, we'll talk about what allows unidirectional blood flow. And the first portion of all that are the valves that close. When those valves, uh, when blood moves from one segment to the next, the valves close as the pressure is higher in this segment, and that allows these valves to close and only allow blood to pull up from direction to direction. So it's, it's basically taking the ladder all the way back up to the heart. Now, what happens with varicose veins are uh, varicose veins start to enlarge. And if you, if, you, if you know anybody with varicose veins, you would see that they're very unsightly veins that are much larger than normal veins. And what that does, it increases the diameter of the veins themselves. And now the flaps don't come together, and therefore, blood, bless you, blood is now allowed to move back through these incompetent valves. These incompetent valves is a form of insufficiency, meaning valves don't fully close. Therefore, blood flows back into the prior segments. And therefore, now that you've got more blood in this area, it's gonna expand it even more. And now that the veins are expanded even more, now the flaps don't close. So someone who has starting varicose veins, you'll see over time, they'll get worse and worse. Right? And they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And for the most part, when you look at any surgeries that actually remove it, I've actually had it done on myself. If you ever have veins that are removed, um, what was my point? Uh, the, the, the veins get bigger and bigger over time. Um, it's mostly, um, you know, for the most part, if you ever get that type of surgery to have uh, varicose veins removed, they'll, they'll view it as like a cosmetic surgery. But the reality is, uh, you know, if you ever complain of, of leg cramps or, uh, or, or swelling that takes place because now you have blood that's pooling up in your leg, you might have edema in that area, that becomes more of a clinical thing as opposed to a cosmetic thing. So um, what, what, what happened with mine was I had to wear like a leg stocking for like three months and prove that it wasn't effective in, in reducing the cramps. So they, basically what they'll do, they come in, they, 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 they strip, they, they cut the, the veins over here and they basically pull all the way throughout. It's, a, a, it's a, uh, what they call ligation, um, that they strip off or ablation. They can, they can come in, they can put, um, 
a hot wire through and it'll basically sear all this and close it all up. The whole purpose of why we want to have that done, well, blood is just sitting there and, you, and you're having a tough time getting blood back too. Well, if that blood is just sitting there, that can cause potential cramps in that area. You get blood that's kind of pulled in this area, so you gotta get a way to get back in. So I'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Anastomoses, uh, anastomoses, uh, again, something that, that doesn't happen all the time, but there are structures where uh, a, a, an arteriovenous anastomosis is just a, a bypass for a capillary vein. And you can see that on our bottom left. Here you can see that pathway. If you're to follow an arterial, blood's supposed to flow through the capillary bed, but if there's ever a blockage in that capillary bed, well, or if you block uh, blood flow through the capillary bed, basically anastomosis says, we're gonna connect the artery and the vein together to allow blood to flow through. We actually have that in the heart as well, um, and that allows uh, for collateral circulation. It's just an alternative route that blood can take so that if, if a vessel were blocked, it's got another route to make its way over to prevent ischemia of that heart tissue. And again, ischemia is a, a term that we'll describe later on. Uh, ischemia is the lack of O2 delivery to tissues. And, and the lack of O2 in that area can, uh, can cause uh, much, much greater necrosis. It's basically uh, death of tissue cells due to lack of oxygen. So myocardial ischemia is ischemia of the of the muscle tissue, and if that uh, if there's a blockage of that of, of blood flow in that area, and that heart can't receive that area of the heart can't receive oxygen, well that area dies off, and that contributes to less less uh, or more dysfunction of the heart, and more dysfunction of the heart muscle results in lowered stroke volume. Lowered stroke volume results in lowered cardiac output. That means somebody who's had a heart attack finds themselves, if they survive it, a 50% chance of surviving your first heart attack, uh, means that you have a decreased quality of life because that heart tissue cannot beat as much as it can. You can't get enough blood pumping out of the, out of the heart. Portal veins, uh, we talked about in our endocrine lecture. This is blood passing in between two capillary vents. And this one is the hypophysial portal veins that travel from uh, the hypothalamus over to the pituitary. We're starting at forces and pressure, and that's slide 22. Because now what we want to look at is the, the delivery of fluid. We're talking about fluid moving in and out of the vessel. And that's going to be one factor that we're going to be looking at and how we're going to be able to deliver stuff to the cells. So here what we have, we have the, let me just draw a cell on here. Here's our cell. And let's say that this is an active skeletal muscle tissue. So therefore, what we're going to see is we're going to see increased CO2 production within and decreased, CO, uh, decreased oxygen. And that's because this cell is undergoing cellular respiration. It's churning out ATP. And therefore, we're going to need to get gases delivered by the capillary surrounding. So we know, which we're going to look at at the, uh, the tail end of this lecture, or actually, I'm sorry, in our respiratory lecture, we know that oxygen is high in the, in, in, in the capillaries, uh, more specifically on the arterial side of the capillaries, and that's going to cause diffusion of O2 from the blood into the interstitial fluid. And then from the interstitial fluid into the cell. So that's going to be simple diffusion, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and that's pretty self-explanatory. How do we get stuff across? When we look at glucose, glucose falls the same way. Glucose out, out in the blood, glucose in the interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid into the cell. Now, what we're going to be specifically talking about is just the movement of fluid. Um, and that fluid is going to be important, too, because that's going to be also another contributing factor to how we're going to get O2, we're going to have glucose move across. So one way to kind of just use an analogy would be like a wave of fluid. You get fluid that moves out of the capillary, and that's going to carry the same nutrients, it's going to carry the same gases along with it. So this is one contributing factor. But in order for us to understand how fluid moves out of the capillary and then in back into the capillary, we have to understand the pressures. 
And so this, I'm going to draw on our old example of our YouTube example. So I'm going to take our tube. I'm going to use that selectively permeable membrane right in the middle. And I'm going to draw our solutes. And our solutes in this case are going to be stuff that's in the capillary. And then this will represent the capillary. I, I, I swear I'm spelling it right. There we go. <coughs> and this will represent the interstitial fluid. And naturally, we're going to have a lot more stuff in the capillary. Because remember, there's things that cannot cross through the capillary. We've got a bunch of blood cells in there. We've got red blood cells. We've got white blood cells. We've got proteins in there that can't necessarily cross through. And in the interstitial fluid, we'll have less things, more, more so like some gases. We'll have some sugars in there. And let me draw those extra dots I'm drawing on there. And as I mentioned before, the direction of, and if I already even up the water levels in there, the direction of water flow, we want to move in the direction of a higher concentration of the solutes. Meaning, in the capillary, we're hypertonic compared to that of the interstitial fluid. And again, hyper, uh, hypertonicity, or tonicity, refers to the amount of solutes in a given amount of fluid. Do you have a question? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Packet? No, I don't. No, I don't. I, I, I trashed those the day of lecture. Um, do you have a computer to pull up? I, I didn't mean mine today, so I'll, okay. I'll, I'll go on Okay. Um, now, the tonicity is, uh, again, referring to the number of solutes in that fluid. And so what we understand by now is the balance of fluid. Which direction does water want to move? Now, water is the only thing that's really going to be moving through that selectively permeable membrane. And that permeable membrane is the endothelium of the capillary. That's what's going to separate the capillary from the interstitial fluid. And water wants to move in the direction in order to balance out the concentrations. So if I've only got two solutes over here and I've got six solutes over there, we're going to effectively bring down the volume on here where water is going to move to the left in order to increase the volume to the right, eventually up to the point that we could manage the same concentration on both sides. So that movement of water, again, was one of our quiz questions. What is, a, what is the movement of water? Osmosis. Osmosis, thank you. So that is the osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure is the pressure moving that water molecule over to the left. So I'm going to draw a water molecule, a single water molecule over here. And osmotic pressure is what's driving that pressure over to the left. Now, looking at the other pressure, the other pressure, eventually we're going to get up to the point that our water volume is going to rise and rise and rise. But that, it's not going to completely rise all the way because we've got a static column of water mixed with a bunch of solutes. And that's going to exert another pressure on the opposite side. And so if you were to think of a bucket and I punctured a hole in the very bottom, we would see that the pressure the water would want to push that water out. And that is what's going to oppose the opposite side. So hydro hydrostatic pressure is pushing off to the right. And another way, again, of looking at the example here is if I take a balloon and I fill it up with water, eventually I can keep filling it up with water, but the pressure that's being exerted by that static column of water is going to push right back out. So that's hydrostatic pressure. Anytime you put fluid in a vessel of any kind, it's going to push back. So that is our hydrostatic pressure. And the hydrostatic pressure will oppose that of osmotic pressure. This is our hydrostatic pressure. Now, the direction of that water movement is going to be inherently dependent on the net pressures. Again, the pressures for coming from the right for our hydrostatic pressure and our osmotic pressure pushing towards the left. 
So if I have more hydrostatic pressure, that's going to push that water molecule over to the right. And what does that mean? That means water is going to be pushed out of the capillary into the interstitial fluid if hydrostatic pressure is higher. Now, in contrast, if osmotic pressure is high, that's going to pull fluid, or if we've got more osmotic pressure than hydrostatic pressure, that's going to push it over to the left. And again, that means water is going to be moving into the capillary. Now that we have that in place, now that we understand the forces that's being exerted on a water molecule, again, I'm looking only at one point, we want to look at the variance uh, from the arterial side and the venous side of the capillary vent, where we're going to be seeing uh, differences in pressures that's going to lend to pushing fluid out of the capillary and pulling fluid back into the capillary. Okay. What questions do we have about this prior slide? Yes? Is, is the hydrostatic pressure that the pressure of like volume or something? It's the pressure of the fluid inside the vessel. If I were to take uh, your vessels right now, and it's filled, well obviously it's filled with blood, there's a pressure being exerted on each point of that vessel, and that's just, the that's just the fluid filling it up. So that's the same thing that's happening over here. I've got a column of fluid or water that's, pr that's putting pressure on the capillary wall. Okay. So as I start to fill this up, it starts to fill up, fill up, fill up, it's weighing down. It's wanting to exert a pressure back on the other side. Anytime you fill something up, in the case of the vessels, it's going to want to push back. So the, the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure is, if we were to think about that in, in terms of, and this is hard to make a lot more sense towards the end of our lecture because we'll be talking specifically more about the pressures out of the heart. When you look at uh, the, 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 the pressure in a vessel, that's going to play a role on pushing fluid out. So let's take a look at the next slide and hopefully that'll start to, uh, to tie that in a little bit more. Now, looking at the uh, capillary, when we look at the net pressures, and that, again, that's a balance of our hydrostatic pressure as well as our osmotic pressures. The balance of all of that throughout the capillary bed is, is all balanced out through what's called starling forces. And that's a measurement of the forces, again, the osmotic pressures as well as our hydrostatic pressures, that will govern the direction at which the fluid moves, at which point the fluid moves out, and which direct, uh, at which point the fluid moves back in. So this should start to make sense. The big picture behind this is if I get filtration, and we'll talk about these, uh, these terms in it just a little bit. If I have fluid moving out of the arterial side, that's gonna allow us to deliver O2. It'll allow us to deliver glucose. It's gonna push fluid out into the tissues. And then on the venous side, we're going to have fluid pulling back into the capillary. And that should make sense because now that helps wash out some of the things on the outside of the cell. Some of the uh, metabolic byproducts. We might be seeing lactic acid being produced by that active cell. And therefore, we want that to diffuse back into the interstitial fluid, back into the blood. So we're seeing fluid exchange that's taking place. So what we need to understand is the direction of fluid exchange that's occurring on the capillary bed. When we have higher pressures, Exerting pressure, moving fluid out, that's what we call filtration. And the easiest way to kind of think about that is, again, we have an endothelial wall. If we want to get only fluid out and keep the red blood cells in, we're filtering water out. And what's actually coming out is something similar to blood plasma, things that are dissolvable in the plasma while keeping the red blood cells on the inside. The other side, where we have fluid entering the capillary due to more pressures pushing blood into, I'm sorry, pushing fluid into the capillary is what we call reabsorption. And what we're doing is reabsorbing fluid back into the blood. So now that we have that established, let's take a look at our next slide. And our next slide uh, should look blank because we're gonna start to fill this out. And each of these uh, I'll be pulling from the next three slides. So the the interstitial fluid and our capillary, our capillary represented by our tube here, you can see the red is more the arterial side. And this is our venous side. And the first thing that we're going to start off with is osmotic pressure. Remember, we've got a bunch of solutes in here. We've got 
Uh, we've got our red blood cells. We've got proteins. We've got hormones in there. We've got albumin. We've got fibrinogen. We've got a bunch of proteins that the liver produces, stuff that's in there. So when we look at the direction of water movement, as I mentioned earlier, osmotic pressure is going to be from the interstitial fluid into the capillary. And that measure is about 26 millimeters of mercury. That's the pressure of osmotic pressure that's being exerted into the capillary at all times. Again, that's the drive for fluid to move into the capillary. The other thing that we also have to look at are the pressures. The pressure on the arterial side is going to be 35 millimeters of mercury. While as that blood flows through the capillary bed, we're going to see a reduction in the pressure. And there's an earlier slide that I think I, I, I know where it is. I can't seem to find it right now. Uh, but the pressure is going to be 35. By the time it reaches the middle, it's going to be 25 millimeters of mercury. And by the time it makes it towards the end, it's going to be about 16 millimeters of mercury. And that's just showing that the pressure, the blood pressure, or in this case would be blood hydrostatic pressure, would drop from the capillary side all the way down to the venous side. The longer blood has to travel through a vessel, the more the pressure is going to drop. Okay. And if you were to, for instance, measure the blood pressures in the aorta, and then measure the blood pressures towards the end of the arm or down by the feet, you'll see that the longer that the blood has to travel, that pressure will decrease over distance. There we go. This is something I want to show you guys. Here you can see the pressure from the heart. Now, if you were to measure the pressures right in the aorta, you can see the pressures are fluctuating quite a bit. And the pressures are, uh, you'll see they'll fluctuate between 80 to about 120 millimeters of mercury, just like we talked about last week. And when we see the diastolic pressure and then the systolic pressures when, uh, during ventricular systole. So now as we make our way down, you'll see the pressure start to decrease. And that's just because we're moving further and further away from the heart. And overall, the pressures will decrease all the way up to the point that we get back to the vena cava. So blood returning back to the heart through the inferior and, and superior vena cava, the pressure's low. And that's just a factor of distance. If you don't believe me, take a garden hose. Take one short garden hose, take one really long garden hose, and turn up the, um, the flow on each of the nozzles at the same rate. And if you were to take a look at the pressure at the end of the short hose, you'll see pressure's hot. It's spewing out water pretty quickly. But you take that all the way, that, that hose that's the longest hose, and you'll notice the pressure's really low. And that's just a factor of blood having to travel its distance. And if you were to take a look at the pressure at the capillaries, which is represented by the purple band, here you can see the pressure's about 36, 35, 36. And by the time it reaches the very end, it's about 15, 16. Again, so now here you can see the appreciable drop from the arterial side over to the capillaries, uh, I'm sorry, to the venial side. So now that we have established, again, 35 millimeters of mercury, 25 millimeters uh, in the middle, and 16 right uh, at, towards the end, there's one factor that we also need to look at, which is the interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. There's still stuff dissolved in the interstitial fluid, things like glucose, Let's just say glucose for now. Uh, there's also some lactic acid in there. There's other, uh, some proteins in there as well. So there's also an osmotic pressure driving outward. And that is what we call our interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. And that pressure is usually about one millimeter of mercury. So you had an osmotic pressure where fluid wants to move into the cell due to the stuff that's dissolved in the blood. And there's also a drive for fluid to move out due to stuff dissolved in the interstitial fluid. But comparatively speaking, you can see the biggest drive for osmotic pressure is into the blood because we've got a lot more stuff dissolved in the blood. So all we need to do at this point is to measure the net pressures, just like I did earlier. If I have 10 millimeters of mercury pressure pushing that uh, water molecule to the right, I have 10 millimeters of, uh, of osmotic pressure pushing to the left, that net pressure is zero. And therefore, the net movement of water is equal on both sides, meaning I've got one water molecule moving in, one, moder one water molecule moving out. So here, all we need to do is just measure 
each of these three. So again, this is the arterial side, this is the middle, and this is the venous side. So measuring that all out, I've got 35 plus 1. So this represents, right in the middle is our hydrostatic pressure. These on the outside represent the osmotic pressures. So measuring this out, 35 plus 1 is 36. And then the opposing direction would be the interstitial fluid. So the net pressures, in this case, comes out to 10 millimeters of mercury out. So therefore, if you look at the pressure on, on the fluid, that's going to push fluid out. We call that filtration. Now on the other side, I've got 25 millimeters of mercury, again, hydrostatic pressure. That's the blood pressure in the capillary. Plus one, 26. Minus the 26 of, hydrost of uh, I'm sorry, osmotic pressure pulling into the fluid. So 25 plus one minus 26. That comes out to zero. So the same amount of water molecules that make out will pull, get pulled back in. So net movement is zero. And then on the venous side, 16 plus 1, 17, minus the 26, comes out to negative 9 millimeters of mercury. And that means there's more fluid going back into the blood than coming back out. And we call that reabsorption. So here you can see the differences in pressures on the arterial side versus the venous side. So what exactly are these numbers that I'm pulling out? If we look at uh, first starting off with the 26 millimeters of mercury, we call that the blood colloid osmotic pressure. And that's described for you on this slide over. Blood colloid osmotic pressure is due to the presence of blood plasma proteins. So therefore, the proteins that are present, hence the term blood colloid, stuff that's dissolved in the blood, you get the osmotic pressure wanting to go into the blood. The other pressure on, on the inside of the capillary that's being exerted out onto the capillary wall, we call blood hydrostatic pressure, BHP. And that's described for you on this slide. And that blood hydrostatic pressure is the pressures generated by the heart. It starts out from the aorta, which is going to be about, about 120 over 80. By the time it makes its way over to the capillaries, you'll see that it's going to vary from 35 over to 16 from the arterial to the venous end. And the last of these is the interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. And again, that's the drive of fluid wanting to move out due to the interstitial fluid proteins and stuff dissolved in the interstitial fluid. So again, a balance of all of these. The other one that we didn't quite mention is interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. And again, hydrostatic pressure would be the pressure in a vessel. And in this case, that would be the pressure in the interstitial fluid. And in this, in normal cases, that interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure is basically zero. And, and, and uh, that's because in a, in, a, in a normal environment, we shouldn't have higher pressures in the hydrostatic, uh, in the interstitial fluid. That should be fairly normalized. And that's really only a factor in edema. So looking at all of this, does this balance out? I've got 10 millimeters of mercury uh, pushing out, pushing fluid out, which we call fi filtration. I've got 9 millimeters of mercury pulling blood back in. Does that balance out to you guys? No. Almost, not, but not quite. So if you were to sum all this up, 10 plus negative 9, that means there's 1 millimeter of mercury pressure difference that is not accounted for in this diagram. That should mean overall there's more fluid going out than there is fluid coming back in. And over time you would think, well, aren't you going to be losing fluid? And that's where the last slide comes in, the excess fluid drainage. Any excess fluid that is secreted out of the capillary, and we do have about 85 to about 90%, and that should make sense, about one out of 10 
millimeters of mercury of pressure is uh, exerted pushing fluid back out. So about 90% of the fluid makes its way back in. The other 10% will remain in the interstitial fluid. So we want to see that where, that, where, that, where it makes its way out, it's going to drain out into our lymphatic system. So we have lymphatic vessels that are present in, embedded within the interstitial fluid. And that allows for this drainage. And that drainage through that lymphatic fluid makes its way through. And if you were to measure the, the stuff that's in the lymphatic fluid, very similar to blood plasma, which should make sense. Because that's what's being filtered, uh, filtered out in the first place. We get blood plasma in here that gets pushed out, then it makes its way in, and then it drains out through the lymphatic vessels to make its way back through the subclavian veins to drain back right into the vena cava, returning back, back to the heart. So this should make sense, especially when you look at what happens in terms of surgeries. Anytime there's a surgery that comes in, let's say a mastectomy, where they remove breast tissue, they could affect any of the lymphatic vessels over there. And what happens with, with those cases? When you start to disrupt the uh, lymphatic vessels flowing back in, you get edema. And so you'll start to see enlargement of the arms. You'll see uh, the inability for extremities to drain fluid back, well, specifically the interstitial fluid. They can't drain that back into the main circulatory system. So if you're ever curious, look into uh, cancer patients. And, and one of the things that they have them do is to wear compression garments they want to be able to exert some form of squeezing that's going on that will allow proper drainage. If you ever look at, uh, if you ever look at diabetic patients and they wear compressive garments, they wear it around their ankles, they wear it around their legs, what they're trying to do in that case is return blood flow back to the heart by providing an excess, uh, by providing extra pressures to drain that back out. So let's kind of play this out now that we're looking at it. Let me just draw our vessels once again. And let's take a look at what happens in the case of edema. So again, edema would be, is, is characterized by excess fluid in or surrounding the blood capillaries and within the tissues. You've got excess fluid build up. So we're going to draw our, our pressures once again. Actually, let me uh, even take a step back and let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at hypertension, shall we? So hypertension, again, is high blood pressure. And we're going to take somebody who's at 120 over 80 and bring it up quite a bit. We're going to bring them up to about 150 over 100. And what that's going to translate out to is going to be a 10 millimeter mercury difference for hydrostatic pressures. If I increase blood pressure, I'm going to increase hydrostatic pressure. So in this case, we're going to have 45 millimeters of mercury, 35, and then 26. The same factors come into play. We get one for IFOP, which is going to be one millimeter of mercury. We're also going to get 26 millimeters of mercury for, high, uh, for our uh, blood colloid osmotic pressures. And then we just measure that out. 46 plus one is 46. Minus 26, 20 millimeters of mercury for filtration. We'll take a look at this one, 35 plus one, 36 minus 26. 10, and at the very end, 26 plus 1 minus 26 is 1 millimeter of mercury. Uh, yes? So how many years subtracting the 26, though? Because the pressure is pushing out. Hydrostatic pressure pushes out, right? Blood colloid osmotic pressure pulls right back in. hydrostatic pressure out, osmotic pressure going back in. And that osmotic pressure is blood colloid osmotic pressure. That's the direction of water moving into a hypertonic solution through the presence of solutes. So these are opposing pressures. The only other one that is not opposing for the osmotic pressures is the direction of fluid wanting to move from the blood into the interstitial fluid, do the stuff dissolved in the interstitial fluid. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. So by, by looking at that 45 plus 1, and then the opposing blood colloid osmotic pressure is 26. Any other questions before we move on?
Now, looking at those pressures, now that we're able to determine the opposing pressures, we see, well, let me ask you guys. Do you see at any point in this example where reabsorption is taking place? Yes. Where do you see reabsorption taking place? This is 20 millimeters out, this is 10 millimeters out, 26 plus 1 minus 26, this is 1 millimeter mercury out. This is still out, 26 plus 1, and then minus 26. So you have to have a negative for it to be reabsorbed. Exactly. So there's no net pressures pushing back in. Now think about what, that ha what happens in, let's say, the case, and I'm just going to draw a very basic leg here. There's my foot. And again, for simplicity's sake, let me just draw one capillary going through. That means more fluid is being exerted to the outside. So more filtration is going to now cause more fluid buildup in the interstitial fluid. The lymphatic vessels can't drain it fast enough, so what you're going to get is going to get edema. And that's going to be a buildup of fluid. Which, not only that, what, that, what, what that's going to do it's going to now increase interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. Now the interstitial fluid surrounding is now going to exert a good amount of pressure because now you've got all this fluid in there. You're going to get more pressures that's going to come back in, which might help balance it out. But nonetheless, any way you look at it, you're going to have more fluid buildup. And it's not uncommon for people with hypertension to have edema swelling of the legs. And again, these are kind of more, uh, 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 more kind of extreme examples. And I know we have corrective measures in this case, but I'm just pointing out that this is worst case scenario, at least a worsening case scenario. So take a look at each of these. You'll see the, the pressures in play. Filtration, these are the pressures being exerted out. So these are all outward <laughs> pressures. These uh, refer to inward pressures. And when you sum all that up, again, 90% of fluid moving out of the capillary, the other 10%, 85 to 90% being reabsorbed through the lymphatic vessels to make its way back into, uh, returning back to the heart. And that's fluid exchange. What questions do we have about fluid exchange? Now moving over to the next slide, we've talked about, again, the movement of fluid. And now what we need to talk about is the movement of everything else. And what I've been able to describe for you is bulk flow. We have two other ways of getting things in and out. We've got diffusion and transcytosis, which I'll describe in a bit. Everything else that we've described is bulk flow, the movement of dissolved and suspended materials with fluid through filtration and reabsorption. Again, that tidal wave of stuff, water moving through out, uh, which is being filtered out of the capillary, and we're gonna have stuff that's also dissolved with it. So O2, CO2, well actually rather O2, uh, CO2 being reabsorbed. Uh, we'll have glucose as well. Everything else, is going to either use diffusion or transcytosis, but the biggest one of them all is diffusion. And diffusion, we've talked about. This isn't new. This is looking at our concentration gradient. Again, as I described earlier in our earlier slide, O2 just diffuses across out of the capillary bed into the interstitial fluid because I've got a higher concentration gradient on the inside of the capillary, and then it's going to move in the directions of where there's a lower concentration. Same thing with our glucose, same well, with everything else, with the exception of the things that are dissolved in blood that can't pass through the endothelium. Now, transcytosis is the other concept, and basically this involves the movement of stuff in between cells. So if I were to take a look at the capillary and really zoom into the capillary, the capillary is going to have simple squamous cells, epithelial cells, very thin layer. And the other way, if they're not moving through in between 
the, uh, the epithelial cells, they're moving through it. So in this case, the only way to get things to move out would be to, do, uh, to undergo endo or exocytosis. Endocytosis to make its way into the cell, exocytosis to, to be ejected out of the cell itself. And when you look at lipid-soluble hormones, let me cross out insulin, because that insulin is actually a water-soluble hormone. Lipid-soluble hormones can diffuse across into the cell, and then they can make their way out the cell as well. And then looking at uh, water-soluble hormones, water-soluble hormones can make their way out through blood flow. And that should make sense because as fluid moves through, uh, filtered out of the capillaries, things that are dissolved in, uh, in the blood should also make its way out. So those are the three main ways. Again, diffusion, uh, which is uh, down its concentration gradient, transcytosis through the cell, and bulk flow, use, utilizing the pressures that we discussed in our prior slides to push fluid out and return that back through the venous side. And all of that is summed up for you on the next slide over. Something you might not be able to read from here, but uh, when, when you look at it, it's pretty much describing everything that we've been able to describe earlier. So utilize this. Um, this talks about the differences in um, uh, outside uh, variations that, uh, that occur. Uh, and I can draw that one out for you. It's basically uh, the first example that talks about the variations that could occur outside of normal capillary function. Let's take a look at what happens when blood pressures decrease. I'm going to draw in contrast. Uh, no, I'm just looking for a different color. Let's uh, take the case of hemorrhaging, blood loss, or low blood pressure. So when we see low blood pressure, we're going to see uh, hydrostatic pressure decrease. So take somebody with abnormally low uh, blood pressure, let's say like 80 over 30 or something like that. And what that's gonna come out to is 25 millimeters of mercury. This is again 10 millimeters of mercury less in hydrostatic pressure for that of somebody who is hypotensive or has undergone high, um, uh, hemorrhage. So 25 millimeters of mercury, 15 millimeters of mercury, and then six millimeters of mercury. Again, same things, 26 for our uh, blood colloid osmotic pressure. Interstitial fluid osmotic pressure is going to be one millimeter mercury. Measure that all out, 25 plus one, 26, minus the 26 for the uh, blood colloid osmotic pressure, zero, zero millimeters of mercury is the net pressure. This one, 15 plus one, comes out to negative 10 millimeters of mercury. And then 6 plus 1 minus 26, negative 20 millimeters of mercury. So looking at these numbers, do I have more pressure going into the capillary or more pressure going out of the capillary? Into. So somebody who has lost blood, we have a system in place to recall more fluids from the interstitial fluid back into the capillary. So take a look at somebody who uh, is undergoing trauma and they've lost a good amount of blood. You would see their skin looks pale and very thin. That's what we call recall of fluids. These are things where more fluid is going back. We're draining fluid back into the capillary to maintain blood pressures. And that's only happening on the tissue level. We haven't even looked at what happens at the heart level, which we'll explore at the end of this lecture, which we call uh, uh, when, when, when we talk about shock. Any questions so far? Yeah, transcytosis, exactly. Transcytosis is the movement of stuff through the cell. Okay. If diffusion is stuff moving just out down its concentration gradient, whether it moves in between the cells, diffusion is just through the cell. And basically all you have uh, if you were to take large molecules, they have to be able to pass through the cell membrane and pass out the cell membrane again. Okay. Does that help? All right. So now looking at any other questions? Yes. 
So looking at, now we're going to take a step back and, and look at where all the blood is stored. And this pie chart, as we looked at in the very beginning of, uh, of this lecture, we saw that where most of the, of the blood is, is specifically in the systemic veins and venules. 64% of your blood is stored in the veins. And I know I was kind of touching on what happens with hemorrhaging, the loss of blood. We have a venous reserve. And if you ever look at it, take a look at somebody who has a fairly thin skin and look at them at rest when they're just sitting there. And I guess, I don't know, I don't know if you want to look at your neighbors or anything like that and look at their veins. Or, or I guess don't be creepy and don't look at their veins. Uh, somebody who's at rest, you'll see that their veins are fairly prominent. And that should make sense because most of the blood is stored in the veins. Now get somebody who is starting to become active and they're starting to exercise a little bit and if you were to look at their veins, what happens is that their veins start to deflate a little bit. Okay. And that's because that blood is returning back to the heart. So what we're looking at in this slide is our venous reserve. What we're doing is redirecting blood back into the heart. So we know that the veins return back to the heart. So if I can just draw our heart, here's our arteries, and here are our veins. And in order to raise blood pressure back up, let's take the case of hemorrhaging. You're, or you're, you get a, a, a decreased blood pressure. Maybe hemorrhaging is a little too extreme. But your blood pressure decreases a little bit. What we want to be able to do is tap into our veins to bring blood pressure back up. Because one thing we're going to learn is that when we see a decrease in blood pressure, there's a decrease in blood flow, which I'll explain later. Now, in order to get blood back to the heart, we can utilize what's called venoconstriction. Because to a certain degree, we do have smooth muscles that wrap around the veins. And if I can help squeeze blood back to the heart in the systemic circuit, I'm getting our veins to return blood back to the heart. That should make more sense because now I've got more blood returning back to the heart. That means that the heart can now stretch out a little bit more and therefore can contract more blood. This concept we discussed is the preload. Again, another one of Frank Starling's uh, concepts of force. The more you stretch out the heart, the more blood that's being pushed out. So now let's take that back. With a drop in blood pressure, we want to employ venoconstriction to squeeze more blood back to the heart, which can stretch back out and then squeeze more blood out to now raise blood pressure. More fluid that, or more blood that's pumped out of the heart will effectively raise that back up. So this is how we're able to increase at least one mechanism of increasing cardiac output is to bring more blood back to the heart. And if we're to take a look at the next slide, the next slide sums up all of the effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic to the right, parasympathetic to the middle, uh, to the middle and the left describes all the different areas that we've looked at. So now this should complete everything we've looked at so far. SA node versus AV node. Again, these are the pacemaker cells. Ventricular muscle and atrial muscle are muscle cells. are our pacemaker cells. Right. And then uh, we, we knew with the SA node, with, paras uh, with the sympathetic output, we know that's going to increase the rate of depolarization of our pacemaker cells, namely our SA node and AV node. Uh, we knew that the sympathetic effect uh, is most prominent uh, on the muscle cells, causing increased contractility. So now I'm only going to take my heart, and I'm going to take the uh, arteries and veins, the, the same thing I described earlier. The sympathetic output is not only going to raise the heart rate, it's also going to cause an increase in the stroke volume. So as we described uh, at the tail end of Thursday, 
we see an increased contraction due to increased calcium uptake by the cells. <laughs> increased calcium uptake then strengthens the contraction, causing that muscle to squeeze even stronger. The stronger the squeeze per beat, the higher the stroke volume. So now, now an increase in heart rate and now an increase in stroke volume effectively increase cardiac output, which should make sense. That's what we're trying to do with sympathetic stimulation, increase cardiac output. Now the last thing on here, well, like the second to last thing is just the adrenal medulla, and this is just showing uh, the effect of increased epinephrine. And epinephrine is there just to supplement uh, the sympathetic output from the central nervous system. Now the veins are going to increase venous return. So uh, sympathetic stimulation is going to increase venous return through venoconstriction. Again, effectively raising the amount or increasing the amount of blood return back to the heart, employing the preload effect. Any questions on that? So now that we're talking about venous return, we've saw venoconstriction. Uh, let's take a look at other ways we can return blood back to the heart. Because now we're going to just take a, a little bit of a step back and look at how uh, blood, uh, and, and to use my example of the foot from earlier, my foot is getting worse and worse as I describe, <laughs> as, I, as I draw it out. When uh, we look at blood flow, I showed you the other slide earlier where we look at the pressures of the blood. Now the pressures of the blood are from 16 all the way up to about five millimeters of mercury. And when we looked at the heart, we saw the direction of blood flow is from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. So now if I take that foot that I drew earlier, and I have venous blood making its way back up the veins, not only do you have low pressures, you got from five millimeter, well I guess in this case maybe 16 millimeters of mercury, all the way back up towards the uh, inferior vena cava where it's about five millimeters of mercury, you have very low pressures returning blood back to the heart. So the question is, how do we counter gravity, right? How do we counter gravity? How do we get blood flow to make its way through the veins to return back to the heart to contribute to that preload? So here, well, let's take a look at the, the structures of the veins. And again, drawing on what we talked about last Thursday, is to look at the valves that are located within the veins themselves. Again, extensions of the tunica interna. These epithelial flaps provide unidirectional blood flow. And that unidirectional blood flow we'll be able to see in just a little bit. I want to just do that as a precursor. The next is the skeletal muscle pump, as well as the action of breathing. So let's take a look at uh, the next couple slides. Here you can see uh, the presence of the valves right here, what they look like. Very similar to what you saw in the valves in the heart itself. So the two main mechanisms of venous return is the skeletal muscle pump. If you were to take a look at the valves, and again, these would be more the deeper veins. If you look at the veins, you can see the veins um, allow blood flow in one direction. But the principle of it is that when blood flows back into, blood flows up in, let me just draw a different color here. Blood flows up and then circulates back around. And the increased pressure in this segment causes this flap to close, preventing blood from leaking back down. So what assists that squeezing of that blood in that segment is the skeletal muscle pump. And you can see that the adjacent muscles surrounding, here we have the tibialis anterior, we have the gastrocnemius and the serratus, and anytime you walk around is gonna help squeeze those different segments. So I can draw our muscle here in green. Squeeze that blood back, employ any sort of minor squeezing, and you don't need much, you just have to have the muscle contraction that takes place, and squeezes those vein segments that allows fluid to move up that chamber. This whole process is what's called milking that blood in that direction. All you're really doing is just squeezing in that area, pushing blood up to the next segment, and so forth. This is one of the reasons that, um, uh, does anybody know any like hairdressers or any people that have jobs where they stand all day? 
Um, one of the things, have you guys heard of what they can do to help in Venus return? Uh, like the, the comp compression, uh, compression. compression, yeah, that's a way of doing it. That helps with the subcutaneous veins, because we do have subcutaneous veins on the outside. Another way that they can employ is to literally just move around. Utilize the skeletal muscle pump. You'll watch people that's, uh, that, that, and I do it myself, I move around quite a bit. By doing that, anytime you're just causing contraction, it's gonna help with venous return. Otherwise, if you just stand in one place at all, all the time, you're not employing that uh, venous return. Blood stays in that segment, and it pulls, and it causes dilation of those veins. And the dilation of the veins will now pull those flaps further away, and that's where you start to see varicose veins. You're thinking a deep vein thrombosis, um, it, which, which basically is the same concept, except uh, blood pools over there and it starts to clot. That formation of the clot, that's an extreme version of it. Um, but that clot formation can come back and once it breaks right back off, can make its way back and clot anywhere. So. Does that also happen when your leg gets numb and you don't move it? Uh, not necessarily. That's, you know, that's, that's a good question. When you get, when you're, when you're, I never even thought about that. When, you're, when your leg is numb, let's say you've kind of cut the circulation off a little bit, I actually don't even know the physiology behind that. I'll look that up. Um, so all that is just the general principle of how we get blood flowing back in. And again, utilizing the skeletal muscle pump as well as the valves. The last is the respiratory pump. And the respiratory pump is going to utilize uh, the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. So I'm just going to draw our uh, thoracic cavity, or rather our, uh, and I'm going to split that up with the diaphragm, which is going to split the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. And just a simple action of breathing is going to help assist in blood return. And think about what happens when, and again, something we'll be able to describe more in detail on Thursday or maybe even more so on uh, next Tuesday, is during inhalation, the diaphragm will contract and move down. So during inhalation, that's going to increase abdominal pressure and decrease thoracic pressure. Again, blood wants to move in the direction from high pressure to low pressure. So that's going to help move blood flow up. During exhalation, during exhalation, the diaphragm is going to relax. And that's going to increase thoracic pressure and decrease abdominal pressure. So as you have your veins, The, the movement of blood is always going to move from a direction of high pressure, higher pressure, down to lower pressure. And then the simple movement of the diaphragm is going to cause differences in pressure changes that allow, the, again, this milking effect to take place to return blood back to the heart. Uh, and yeah, that's really it. Uh, what questions do we have about the pressures? Because the next slide is going to talk about, uh, has anybody ever seen anybody do any jet fighter pilot training of any kind? And, or even astronaut training? What, what they do is uh, our pilots would subject themselves to high G-forces. Basically, the, uh, uh, the pressures that, they, that, are, are, that are exerted that would pull blood away from their head. Uh, what happens in those cases? Uh, they're subjected to these high pressures. Imagine somebody who's on a jet and they're going to curve upwards. And the force of gravity is so strong that it could pull blood from their head. It's not pulling all the blood, but you're going to see a, uh, the, the, the blood pressure loss in the head due to blood wanting to pull back down. So this is an increased gravitational force that's pulling their blood towards their legs. So one of the things that they have to do and, and pilot training is to employ the same things that we've learned about, is to maintain or increase venous return. So one, one of the things I'll instruct them to do is to clench all their extremities. And that's employing the skeletal muscle pump to occlude blood from flowing down to the extremities. So employ the, the uh, skeletal muscle pump, block the veins, and that's, what, that's gonna keep blood flow in the thorax. 
And then lastly, they're going to do what's called the Valsalva maneuver. And the Valsalva maneuver, if you uh, haven't heard that before, is what we do to, um, it's simply put, it's what you're doing when you're doing a number two. You're just kind of, you're trying to force something out. You're clenching your abdomen. You kind of take a breath and you kind of hold your breath for a second. <laughs> and by doing that, you're going to increase abdominal pressure and you're going to block the um, inferior vena cava. So by doing that, you're effectively keeping all the blood in this area to prevent blood draining. So what that does is it's actually going to raise blood pressure, but now blood is going to be pulling it back down. It's going to bring blood pressure back down. So this pilot training, what they're doing in this case is to employ that. Again, skeletal muscle pump as well as the Valsalva maneuver to prevent the loss of consciousness that occurs during high G-forces. And you can see what's going to happen. You can see stages of gray out, tunnel vision, blackout, and G-lock, which is called G-force induced loss of consciousness. Let me play you the slides of somebody who's practicing. So they put them in these chambers. Should be. Here you can see uh, the guy's face, you can see the draining that's taking place, and there he passes out. Oh my gosh. And then they'll re you'll see the G-forces right it back up, they'll bring it right back up. Blood return comes back up, it comes back in. This guy's a little scary because he's spazzing out a little bit, but then he comes back too and he's like, what happened, where am I? <laughs> happens if you pass out, especially with the amount of blood flow. That uh, the decreased amount of blood flow, cerebral blood flow. Can we watch it again? Want to watch it again? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why we don't have volume here. This isn't working. It's always worked before. So here you can see the G forces 1.5, normal, uh, almost a little bit above G, normal G force. They do that to acclimate them. G of one is normal gravitational force. Watch them raise it. It's gonna go up to about 10, eight, 10, when they first test it. You tell them to clench, hold on to uh, the joystick, and there they raise it. Watch them, he's squeezing. They bring up to eight. You can see the amount of gravity that's pulling on his eyelids, and he's out. And this is important. They have to learn how to do this because they're flying multi-million dollar jets. Maybe it's not even a million, maybe it's billions. I don't actually I don't know. It's millions. And also their lives are at stake. Yeah, lives at stake, of course. And of course, <laughs> of course casualties. <laughs> Most importantly, their lives, that's right. There's a video of a pilot who loses consciousness and he regains it and it controls the, the same jet that he was on. Wow. I'm pretty so sure they're trained for that though. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there are systems in place to prevent this. Uh, yeah, sure with autopilot. Yeah. So he's out cold and he comes right back in. If they were to sustain that for quite some time, which obviously they wouldn't, um, that decreased amount of blood flow to the brain can cause ischemia and cause some. It'll happen in less than a minute, right? What's that? Mm -hmm. Doesn't take long. very long. And this one you can't really see, but. He basically passes out, and it's, I don't know how many minutes of it, and just for the interest of time, you guys got the idea, right? Yeah. So what happens with the different stages? Gray out, tunnel vision, blackout, and G-lock. So you'll see that the, the differences in the stages of this, it's not like the first thing that happens is you pass out. If you were to ask them to report what symptoms they're seeing, they call gray out. Gray out is the loss of color vision, and that's due to the decreased blood flow that's happening in the retina. We know that the cones, which see color, typically will fire more, and of course require more uh, blood flow to the retina for that. So the first thing we lose is color vision. 
The next, the, what we lose is tunnel vision. So we see the loss of our peripheral vision. And our only focus is of that of the macula lutea. That's our central vision. So everything starts to close up and they can only see uh, centrally. The last thing would be blackout where there's a complete loss of vision. They can still hear everything. They're still conscious, but they just can't see. And the last is uh, vision. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, g -log. So last is uh, loss of consciousness. Why is it our vision that goes, uh, goes out first? Well, we do have intraocular pressures, the pressure of the eye itself. And the loss of fluid to that reduces uh, any sensory function within the eye. So looking at uh, the Venus return, so we've been able to describe what techniques we employ in order to return uh, blood back to the heart. You'll see uh, the pressures starting from the aorta all the way to the vena cava. Uh, our, our image to the left is going to show us the pressures. And you see the pressure fluctuating again with systolic versus diastolic, making our way all the way out to the arterioles. Then it smooths out. We see the loss of the differences between systolic and diastolic pressure as we make, for, make our way from the capillaries out to the veins. <coughs> and again, to take a look at that pressure, uh, what that purple line represents is our mean arterial pressure. And mean arterial pressure, again, is the systolic minus diastolic, divide that by three, plus a diastolic pressure. So, so for somebody who has uh, I guess in this case would be about 105 minus 70, 30 by 10, 10, 110 minus 70, four, uh, 40, divided by 3, 13.3, 13.3 plus the diastolic of about 70. That should make sense. That's our mean arterial pressure. That difference is in systolic versus diastolic, again, lost by the time you get to our capillaries. And then you'll see an effective decrease in the hydrostatic pressure as we go from the arterial side down to the capillaries, just like we described in our earlier slides, and back down to our veins. Now, why do we see a decrease in the capillaries? We should start to take a look at the velocity. So looking at the blue, if you can focus your attention on the blue regions, everything from the venous side of the capillary uh, to the vena cavus, you can see there's an appreciable decrease that continues all the way up to the point we where we enter back into the heart from after the vena cava. If you're to take a look at the cross-sectional, or, or rather the velocity, so if we see the pressure, let's take a look at the velocity. The velocity of the blood, again, these are systolic waves where you get high pressures, lower pressures, higher pressures, lower pressures. We get down to the capillary, and then we see the velocity starting to increase despite pressure starting to decrease. So what we're gonna start moving into is tying in pressure versus the velocity or the flow of the blood, and then also tying into the cross-sectional area. So here we can see, as we mentioned earlier, for the capillaries, we would see the capillary, the cross-sectional area starting to increase for the capillaries. That gives us more pathways for blood to flow through the capillary bed. And then once it drains back out, let me just draw that off for you. And then that converges back into the venule side. The cross-sectional area decreases back by the time we reach back towards the veins. And as we start to converge back, now you see all that blood that's flowing through these three different pathways. Now they're going to converge back. We would expect velocity to come back up. But keep in mind, the distance that we're moving down the length of the vessel, pressure decreases but the velocity starts to increase back right when we get to, well, well, velocity decreases when we get to the capillary bed, which we can see here, and then the velocity starts to increase once we get back to the venule side. So we start to see a decrease in the cross-sectional area, and then an increase in the velocity. And another way to think about that, again, uh, as I talked about on Thursday, is to think about what happens in a stream. When, uh, when water's flowing through, and then you get this whole like lake area where water can flow through, Water flow through that lake is very slow until it converges back through that area where it flows right back through. So let's take a look at the next slide, which was going to help tie us in pressure, flow, and resistance. And looking at each of these, uh, these terms, blood pressure is the hydrostatic pressure. And that's the force 
that's being exerted on the vessels. Blood flow is just like cardiac output. It's how much fluid is moving through that vessel. And then resistance are all the different factors that oppose the flow. And I'll talk about these in just a little bit. So first I want to start off by looking at uh, looking at our tube right here. Or rather, I'm just going to have a bucket filled up with water. I've got a big bucket on my desk, and on there, I want to take a look at what would drain that bucket faster. If I were to puncture a small hole versus puncturing a bigger hole, which of those do you think is going to cause water to flow out the fastest? The bigger hole. The bigger hole, right? So you'll see that the radius of that hole is going to make a difference. The, uh, another thing that will uh, tie in is the length of the vessel itself. As I mentioned earlier, take a short garden hose, take a very long garden hose. The longer the hose, the reduced flow that takes place. And if I were to just draw out a really long vessel, over time that pressure is going to decrease because of the size of the vessel. The vessel wall will start to de decrease over time. That, that, and that will effectively slow it down by the time you reach the very end. Another thing to look at would be the thickness of the fluid. If I've got fluid in here, like just normal water, that'll drain out fairly fast. But if I fill this up with oil, that's going to take longer for that stuff to drain out. So the viscosity is another factor as well. So looking at this pathway, I mentioned earlier, I have that huge bucket and I, in that bucket, I've got a smaller hole versus a bigger hole. I want to point out that resistance, the bigger thing of all the different factors that come into play. The biggest factor is going to be the radius of the vessel. And again, the radius would be, if I were to take the size of the hole, it would be from the middle to the length. The radius of the vessel is going to be the biggest factor. So let's take a look at the size of the bigger hole versus the little hole where the bigger hole has a radius of 2 and the smaller hole has a radius of 1. The resistance is proportional to 1 over the radius to the fourth power. That means that if I were to take that first vessel, or let me take the first vessel. The first vessel has a radius of 4, or I'm sorry, a radius of 1. 1 over 1 to the fourth gives us a resistance of one. And what do I mean by resistance? Let me, let me give you another example. Resistance would be uh, like the size of the tube itself. If I were to take like a small coffee straw versus taking one of like those bigger boba straws. If you were to blow into a smaller straw, there's a good amount of resistance in there just due to, this, to the narrowness of the vessel. Versus taking uh, one of those bigger boba straws you can blow into and you can get more air out through it because it's naturally bigger. So that represents the resistance, how much effort you have to be able to blow uh, out through that hose, or not the hose, I'm not sure, the straw. So the resistance in this case is one, where if I take something that is double the radius, that's one to two to the fourth power, that'll be two times two times two times two, that comes out to one sixteenth. That means that the bigger vessel is sixteen times less than that of the smaller just by having the size of the radius. Or conversely, the resistance increases 16 times when you half the radius. So looking at that, um, I'll, I'll show you the other equation for that in just a bit. Looking at all of this, we can see that the, the pressures are all related to blood flow. And we're more interested really on the amount of flow that's tied into the amount of resistance. And all these factors come into play. So when we look at the uh, blood pressures, well, it's easier for us to read blood pressures than it is to read blood flow. So if I want to take a look at your heart and say, what's the best way to be able to measure uh, your cardiac function? Is to measure your blood pressure. And that should be a good indication of the flow. When I increase the pressure of something, the flow should increase. And that should make sense. If I increase pressure, that should be able to be effectively push blood through that vessel. So we can measure blood pressure because it's related to blood flow. 
And then when we tie in resistance, which we already know resistance is tied in again to the radius of the vessel, we want to take a look at the relationship between all of these. And this is going to follow something very similar, uh, which was called Ohm's Law, Ohm's Law something from physics. It's basically blood pressure equals flow times resistance. And while I'm not going to have you guys calculate these things, I will just kind of give you the general idea behind this. If the resistance is the same, let's say that uh, the, the, the diameters of the vessels are normal. If I see, uh, if I take a look at increased blood pressure, that should mean there's an increase in blood flow. And then lastly, if flow is the same, let's say the flow flowing out of the heart is the same, any increases in blood pressure means there's an increase in resistance. So let's take a look at the next slide, which is going to, to look at ways we can increase blood flow. And that, when you, again, when you think about the sympathetic output, we want to increase blood flow to the muscles. We can do one of two ways to increase flow. I can increase blood pressure while keeping the resistance the same, or if the blood pressure is the same, I can increase flow by decreasing resistance. So if I were to take that example from earlier, we want to increase sympathetic output, and I want to decrease blood flow to the stomach, and increase flow to the muscles. Right? So this would be the aorta. Again, very simplified uh, diagram. I want to be able to redirect blood flow to which area? Do I want to bring it to the muscles, or do I want to bring it to the stomach? I want to bring more blood flow to the, uh, to the muscles. I can't really increase pressure. If, if the aorta, or aortic pressure is 120 over 80, I can't really make it like 200 over 100 over here and bring blood pressure back down in the stomach. That's not how it works. The thing is that's going to make the biggest impact is decreasing the vascular resistance. And vascular resistance we can, uh, again, looking at that resistance, the biggest factor for resistance is going to be the diameter of the or the radius of the vessel. The other factors of resistance are the amount of red blood cells. So somebody who has more red blood cells in their blood would make their blood more viscous. That was my example of blood doping that I used earlier, where athletes would inject more of their red blood cells back into their blood, which should increase the oxygen carrying capacity, but it makes their blood thicker. And again, your heart has to work hard to be able to pump that thicker blood. The other thing on there is increased total blood vessel length. The longer the vessel, the harder your heart has to work to be able to push blood down that length of the vessel. Why is this important? Obesity is another factor. When you think about increased fat deposition, when you see somebody storing more fat, why does that play a harder role on the heart. Well, when you think about that fat deposition, fat is a tissue. And in order to keep tissue alive, we have to create vessels around it. And those vessels would be capillaries that feed that fat. So in that case, anytime you, um, anytime you have fat deposition, every kilogram of fat that you store, you actually create 400 miles more of capillary beds into that area. So that means that more blood that has to be delivered to those areas, which will effectively raise resistance because now your blood has to travel further. The biggest factor for uh, affecting resistance is the blood vessel radius, like I mentioned earlier. In fact, if we were to take a look at the equation, and no, I'm not going to have you guys uh, memorize this equation, but the resistance is tied into pi r to the fourth and a times mu times length of the vessel, great. So resistance is equal to a factor of eight 
times mu, where mu is the viscosity of the blood. L is the length of the vessels. And R is the radius of the vessel. Viscosity of the blood is going to pretty much stay the same. The length of the vessels is going to almost pretty much stay the same. These things aren't really things that we can adjust very quickly in order to redirect blood flow to the muscles. I can't make the viscosity higher for the blood that's going over the muscles. I can't uh, increase the length <laughs> of blood flow for the stomach. But what I can adjust immediately is the radius of the vessel. So therefore, what I would want to do for the stomach is to decrease the radius of the arteries leading to the gastrointestinal system. So by decreasing the radius by half, means I'm decreasing the amount of flow by 16. I'm increasing resistance that would prevent or decrease the amount of blood flow to that area. While at the same time, I would want to increase the radius of the, the arteries leading to the muscles. So again, the biggest factor for, uh, for all of this would be the radius. And we employ that through, again, through what we call vasoconstriction. or vasodilation, vasodilation would lead to de decrease in resistance, and vasoconstriction would result in increased resistance. Not to confuse this for venoconstriction, which was related to the veins, this is related to the arteries. So therefore, in that last slide, I want vasodilation for the muscles to increase blood flow to the muscles. I want vasoconstriction to decrease blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract. And we can do that all through the sympathetic output that targets the vessels in that area. So looking at this, when, when, we, see the, when we see the converse of this, what happens with parasympathetic output? Parasympathetic output, we want vasoconstriction of the arteries leading to the muscles, and we want vasodilation of the areas leading to the stomach. So this vasodilation and vasoconstriction, we're constantly adjusting the radius of the vessels. And because we, we adjust it so much, the arteries actually need to be very elastic. So when you look at the, uh, and something that they look in, in cardiology, is to look at arterial stiffness, which is a major factor. We want the vessels to be able to expand and constrict. That allows the changing of the radius of the vessels to allow more blood flow or less blood flow. And uh, you'll hear the term arterial stiffening. You'll hear arterial compliance. These are all factors at looking at ways we can make sure that your artery arterial health is good and uh, other factors that come into play arthrosclerosis so if you take your arteries and then you get that plaque formation on the outside what's going to what's going to happen with the vessel wall it's going to start to stiffen so you get fibrosis that occurs on the arteries and now that you've got a narrowed uh, radius here you've got decreased surface area that blood can flow through, you get decreased blood flow through that area. And then not only that, you can't increase or decrease the radius of it because it becomes stiffened. So this is where they play a major role in looking at fatty deposits in your arteries. Why they want to make sure that uh, your arteries will work the way they're supposed to in order to accommodate to increase and decrease blood flow. Well, the cause of stroke is the breaking of that fatty deposits. Because over time, these, as your arteries are opening and closing, or I'm sorry, uh, 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 vasodilating and vasoconstricting, that could potentially loosen up that fatty deposit, and then it breaks off. And once that breaks off and makes its way through the circulatory system, that could end up uh, lodging somewhere in the brain, 
uh, causing decreased cerebral blood flow to that area, causing ischemia of that particular brain tissue. And that could be irreversible um, if not caught at an early time. So now that I've described all of vasodilation and vasoconstriction, um, what I've started leading into is autonomic regulations. Uh, these are the different uh, systems that we have in play, and I'll just talk a little bit about it, about how we can adjust the pressure as well as the flow through those different areas that we talked about, whether we're moving from the muscles down to the stomach. How do we do that? We have the autonomic nervous system. We'll take a look at baroreceptor reflexes, chemoreceptor reflexes. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the endocrine pathways with, with the production of our catecholamines, and then vascular autoregulation. How do we maintain normal blood flow at times when, we're, when we've seen a decrease? As we've talked, we've talked about the normal capilla uh, capillary function. We've talked about the movement of fluids, as you know. Filtration taking place on the arterial side. Reabsorption taking place on the venous side of our capillary. Now we know how it's supposed to work. Now let's start to talk about how we can adjust in order to or adjust our, our, our blood pressures as well as adjust blood flow and all the mechanisms in our cardiovascular system in order for uh, autonomic regulation. How do we speed things up? How do we slow things down? And with that, we need to talk about the feedback system, all things that are going to be, uh, uh, all the sensory information that's going to be led back into the central nervous system um, in order for us to help regulate the cardiovascular system. Uh, we'll talk about the renal pathways, the kidney function in order to maintain normal blood pressure. And then we'll talk about the endocrine functions as well, what hormones are going to be released in order to maintain regular function. And lastly, we'll talk about vascular autoregulation. So these are things that are geared to make sure that adequate blood flow to our critical organs, or to all organs, all functional organs, are maintained. So with that, this is going to start to revisit some of the things that we've already seen before. Uh, looking at the top of page 15, our autonomic nervous system. We mentioned earlier that central nervous system does provide autonomic regulation of the cardiovascular system as well as the vessels. So we saw with sympathetic pathways, we saw an increase in heart rate, the intrinsic heart rate as our sympathetic pathways uh, as well as our parasympathetic pathways led directly to the SA node and the AV node. And that would drive up heart rate, which is one part of our cardiac output. Okay. The second part would be the sympathetic pathways that lead to the ventricular muscle mass. And the ventricular muscle, uh, uh, leading to the ventricular muscle mass to increase the contractility of the heart muscle. And the last thing that we were able to see was the effect of of the sympathetic nervous system on venoconstriction. So constrict the veins, squeeze that blood out of the veins, get that to return back to the heart, and that's going to increase preload. By increasing preload, that's going to increase our stroke volume, how much blood is pumped out. If we get more blood into the heart, we can pump more blood out per heartbeat. So that's an increase on stroke volume. So those are our mechanisms in place. And we're going to be able to receive input from all of those receptors that we talked about in our sensory lecture. Proprioception, our baroreceptors, as well as our chemoreceptors. Again, proprioceptors were our kinesthetic receptors. They tell us the state of what we're doing at the time. Are we moving around? Are our joints moving? The stretch receptors, all of that. Okay. Our, our, is our head moving around when we can measure static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium? Uh, we'll look at our baroreceptors. And the baroreceptors we mentioned, as well as our chemoreceptors, are located in the carotid arch as well as, I'm sorry, carotid sinus as well as our aortic arch. And that ties into our next slide over on, 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 on the middle side on page 15. Lastly, you're also going to see uh, um, minor, uh, minor baroreceptors that are located in the kidneys as well as the atrial walls, which we'll talk about in the next slides over when we get to renal autoregulation and hormonal so heart rate autoregulation. So we'll talk about those. So looking at our baroreceptors, uh, looking at our baroreceptor reflexes, 
you'll see that the reflex here, the carotid sinus reflex, basically will normalize blood pressure in the brain. So the carotid sinus is gonna be important because this is where we wanna maintain normal blood pressure to the brain. Obviously, if we don't have enough blood flow to the brain tissues, that's gonna to start to affect autonomic regulation. Central nervous system is everything. It is our central control for all the systems. So in any, any mechanism where we start to see a decrease in, in blood pressure, what we're gonna see is uh, with a decrease in blood pressure, that means our baroreceptors aren't firing as well as they're supposed to. So the less firing of our baroreceptors results in the cardiovascular center firing more. And that's all due to sympathetic pathways that are going to uh, increase sympathetic output. So we increase sympathetic output, at the same time we wanna decrease vagal tone meaning we want to decrease the amount of parasympathetic output. So um, one of the quiz questions, I believe, I remember, I don't remember if it was a quiz question, um, but if you were to raise your heart rate, let's say you start running, you want to raise your heart rate, we decrease parasympathetic output, so we go from 70 beats per minute resting heart rate, brings us up back up to the intrinsic firing rate of the SA node at 100 beats per minute. And then if we want to beat faster, then we increase sympathetic output. And with that, that's going to be the effect specifically on the heart, where we see increased heart rate and increased stroke volume with the same mechanism that I just described. And then we'll be looking at the vessels. What vessels? The uh, venous blood reserve or return. This was venoconstriction. Squeeze the veins, get more blood flowing back, as well as vasomotor tone in the arterioles. So what do I mean by vasomotor tone? That's basically vasodi uh, vasodilation in are involved organs, namely uh, leading to that to the brain, skeletal muscle, heart, lungs, things that are, in, are all part of, this, of the sympathetic response. Things that are not going to be critical, gastrointestinal tract, kidneys, so forth. So we'll decrease, therefore we'll vasoconstrict those vessels leading up to those organs in order to redirect blood to our critical organs. So that redirection of blood through, uh, through, through vasodilation and vasoconstriction is what we call shunting. And we'll explore that concept more in our respiratory lecture, actually towards the end of this lecture. And then what happens with that? So employ those mechanisms where we increase sympathetic output and decrease parasympathetic output, both on the heart as well as the vessels, is going to be the effect of increasing blood pressure. So what starts off as a decrease in blood pressure as received by the carotid baroreceptors leads to an increase in blood pressure. Okay. So that, in effect, is another form of negative feedback. How we maintain homeostasis in blood pressure. So leading to that, why is it important to have normal blood pressure? As I mentioned, we want to make sure that blood pressure is normal within the capillaries, because this is our exchange, these are our exchange vessels. These are the ones that are delivering all of our necessary glucose delivering our gases through those three same mechanisms that we talked about, bulk flow, which is the movement of fluid, transcytosis, which is the movement through the endothelium, and then lastly, through diffusion. So those mechanisms are what we need in order to maintain pressure. If we see a decrease in pressure, we see fluid moving back in. We see recall of fluids. We don't want that. If we see too much, then we get more fluid in, in cases of hypertension, we get more fluid or more pressure in the capillaries. And that's going to lead to more fluid out in the interstitial fluid, which will result in edema. So we want to make sure that that is in place. So with that, we're going to take a look at page 16, the chemoreceptor reflexes. So with that, I've been talking about blood pressure. We want to see, are there any other chemical signals that the, the body can receive to tell us the state of our tissues? And that also involves our chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptor reflexes. So the same places where we have baroreceptors, namely our carotid bodies as well as our aortic bodies, have the same chemoreceptors that detect changes <coughs> in our blood gases, namely our O2 and CO2. And it should make sense. If those bodies detect low oxygen, right, so O2 levels are starting to drop, that must mean that I'm not getting enough oxygen to the brain. Therefore, what should I do? 
get the cardiovascular to, system to pump more, get more blood flowing to the brain. Okay. Let me give you uh, an example that we already talked about. We talked about G-lock. G-lock was where we saw the loss of consciousness due to our jet fighters as they're flying up and they have, they're exposed to high G-forces. That's pulling uh, blood or decreasing blood pressure in the brain. And therefore, we're going to start to see hypoxia. And why did those people pass out? Well, it's due to low O2. So what happens in that case? Well, they should be able to raise blood pressure back up. Okay, that might be an extreme example. Let me give you another example. Orthostatic hypotension. Does anybody ever feel, have the feeling of getting up real quickly and then you feel kind of dizzy? Yeah, I get that all the time. What happens? What do you guys notice? You notice your blood pressure go up? You just, you just know your blood pressure goes up? You're like, oh man, my blood pressure's going up. No, that's not true. Well, well I, actually, I don't know if that's true. You know, if you can feel your blood pressure, good for you. Um, but what you do notice is that your heart starts to beat faster. In fact, it's actually a fairly fast response. You might start to feel a little bit dizzy, but essentially your heart rate will go up. And why do we do that? Well, we're increasing cardiac output. Increased cardiac output, increased blood flow due to our O2 levels dipping a little bit, and hence blood pressure decreasing. We want to make sure blood pressure is normal in order to make sure that fluids still move. Excess CO2. So looking at low O2 and excess CO2 in the case of uh, high metabolism. So you've got, uh, let's say the, uh, in our systemic circulation, we've got low O2 and more CO2 building up due to our tissues being actively our uh, cellular, cellular metabo cellularly metabolically active. So we're going through cellular respiration at a fast rate, we're churning out ATP, and therefore we're going to see that we're gonna see a decrease in O2 as well as an increase in CO2. And also we will see increased acidosis, meaning more hydrogen ions being secreted from lactic acid, all the other byproducts of cellular respiration will start to see leak in. Those hydrogen ions can also be buffered, but any acidosis that's taking place, again, we need to ramp up cardiac output. So bring it up, and therefore to maintain homeostatic values, maintain normal blood pressure. So all these you've seen already, again, looking at input to cardiovascular center, and then the outputs, whether the heart and then the blood vessels in order to maintain normal blood pressure. We'll also see in our respiratory lecture, the effect of the sympathetic pathways. I've talked about trying to ramp up the cardiovascular system, to increase the amount of O2 and get rid of CO2. By ramping up the cardiac output, we will see how we enhance gas exchange in the lung through sympathetic output. Vascular autoregulation, and the term over here is autoregulate. So the term auto means auto, automatic. It's not autonomic where we have the central nervous system innervating uh, the vascular beds, specifically the capillary tissues. This is the ability of a tissue to automatically do it on its own without any form of central nervous stimu uh, system stimulation whatsoever. So in these cases, what this is basically saying, again, we have our arterial, we have our met arterial that's leading into the capillary bed. We have the precapillary sphincters that are those little nozzles that are auto uh, automatically regulated uh, in order to increase blood flow or decrease blood flow. So in the cases where we want to increase blood flow, we have these uh, precapillary sphincters that will respond to certain stimuli. And the stimuli on this case for physical change, what do I mean by physical change? Temperature, temperature's a good one. So temperature, when we see an increase in temperature, that's going to open up those precapillary sphincters and deliver more blood flow to that capillary bed. And the term that I'll talk about again later on is what we call perfusion. Perfusion is the blood flow into a capillary bed or into a tissue. So this is specifically one tissue that we're looking at. We want to be able to increase blood flow through that area. Why, why temperature? Well, think about what happens through cellular respiration. We're producing ATP, we're producing energy, but a good amount of that energy is going to be used as heat, which was our second law of thermodynamics. 
We're going to produce heat at the same time we're producing ATP for our active tissues. Uh, the next thing also, again, trying to think about the converse, why would we apply cold to, uh, to a certain tissue? That causes vasoconstriction, or specifically in our vessels, that will cause di uh, constriction of our capillary beds. If you have inflammation in that area and you want to uh, decrease the amount of blood flow to that area, you put a cold pack on there, and that will close up those precapillary sphincters and therefore get blood to flow through without more flowing through. Vasodilators and vasoconstrictors. So these are going to be under the effect of other hormones. And the one that we talked about is nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator. That will come in and open up those vessels as well. Any other byproducts that come in, like lactate, will also open this up. So if you've got a bunch of lactate in that capillary bed, You've got your muscle, muscle tissues over here that are churning out lactate that are diffusing out into the interstitial fluid. That will come in and also start to affect the precapillary sphincters to open them up. Again, bring more blood flow, therefore bring more oxygen, and rely less on anaerobic metabolism. Because you want to use that, that pyruvic acid and get that into the mitochondria, get enough oxygen into the mitochondria so you can start making more ATP per glucose molecule. So that makes it much more efficient. So this is the case. All the things that I've been describing are the cases of the systemic circuit, where you have a muscle tissue, and in response to low O2 or high CO2, will come in and dilate the precapillary sphincters. And that's only relevant for the systemic circuit, where vasodilation with low O2 to increase blood flow there. Now, the other system that we'll be looking at, the pulmonary circuit, pulmonary circuit is different. When we look at the capillary beds within the lungs, we're gonna be doing the exact opposite. So if there's not enough O2 in that area, the capillaries are going to want to close up, as opposed to opening up in our systemic circuit. They wanna close up, because if there's not enough O2, that's not an area that, uh, of the lung that has a lot of oxygen. It's not an oxygen-rich area. Therefore, it's a waste to bring blood through there to participate in gas exchange if there's not enough of an O2 gradient to pull O2 in. And that will make more sense when we talk about that in our respiratory lecture. So you'll see that this is a very different response, vasodilation with low O2 and pulmonary uh, uh, vasoconstriction with low O2. Again, really just the programming of these precapillary sphincters. Renal autoregulation, these are the pathways that we lead, again, uh, all through the, the, the kidneys in order to maintain blood pressure. As we'll learn in our urinary lecture, we do have juxtaglomerular cells in the kidneys that will determine the amount of blood flow, again, related to blood pressure. So those are baroreceptors that are located uh, in that area that determine the amount of blood pressure in that area. So this is going to employ the RAS system, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which we talked about at the very end of our endocrine lecture. And in this process, remember, our stimuli, or our stimulus in this case, is decreased blood pressure. What we want to do is raise blood pressure. So any decrease in blood pressure, uh, this system is going to be conserving water and conserving salts. Specifically, we want to conserve sodium. We want to not really so much conserve potassium. And we also want to conserve water. So again, we can just kind of briefly go over this because I know you guys already seen this before. But the decrease in blood pressure results in renin release by the kidneys. And the uh, renin release is that enzyme that is going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Uh, I'm sorry, renin is going to uh, con I'm sorry, convert our angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. So angiotensin 1 is going to make its way through our, our, the ACE en enzyme, our angiotensin converting enzyme, will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 in the lungs. Angiotensin 2 on its own is a vasoconstrictor. So it'll make its way to the vessels to constrict the vessels. What does constricting the vessels do? should raise blood pressure back up. Take a vessel, squeeze it, raise blood pressure. So that's our way of raising blood pressure. 
The other effect is angiotensin II, um, when it makes its way over to the adrenal cortex, gets converted into aldosterone. We see the secretion of aldosterone, which will work in our kidneys to do exactly that, raise sodium, decrease potassium, and raise water. So now what we're doing is we're constricting the vessels in response to low blood pressure. We constrict the vessels and we conserve water. We have less secretion of water in the kidneys. And that should effectively raise blood pressure back up. What questions do we have about that so far? Hormonal autoregulation. This we've already talked about. So epinephrine, norepinephrine. We're, we, we've gone over that. That is sympathetic output. The antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that we haven't quite talked about. We did talk about its, its way, uh, and, and again, antidiuretic hormone is the hormone that, it, that helps us conserve water. It's not related to sodium or potassium. It's strictly an antidiuretic. Stop us from peeing excess water. So in response to, again, dehydration or decreased blood volume, low blood pressure, we want to conserve water, and that will turn off uh, our, our way of, um, that will enhance water reabsorption in the kidneys. The other thing that we also called ADH was vasopressin. That was the other name. So it also has a direct effect on the arteries to conserve them, or to, to constrict them. So where did ADH work on? Um, not only did it work on the vessels for as vasopressin, so here we're, this is our arterial, arterioles. So that was area number one where it works. Number two, it works on the kidneys, Speci specifically the uh, collecting duct. And the third was our sweat glands. Remember, our sweat glands respond to acetylcholine. And so you get sympathetic innervation of the sweat glands. ADH comes in and inactivates the sweat glands. That makes sense, because that's our other way of losing water. The last of them, uh, of a hormone, is called atrial natriuretic peptide. This is a hormone that we haven't quite talked about, but this is a hormone that's secreted by the atria. Why is it important? Well, it's a diuretic. So the stretching of the atria due to blood, increased blood flow from the vena cavas into the right atria is gonna cause lowering of blood pressure. So the atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP, is released by the atrial cells. We have stretch receptors in there. As the right atria stretches out, it must mean we've got a lot, we've got high blood pressure because the atria that is stretching out. Therefore, that release of ANP is going to decrease blood pressure as a, as a potent vasodilator. So we, number one, re lower blood pressure. Number two, reduce blood volume. And how does that work? Well, it's the exact opposite of the other enzymes that we've talked about, aldosterone. Um, ADH. And then yeah, aldosterone and ADH. So these are the antagonist relationship. So looking at that, as I mentioned earlier in our prior slide, where I talked about the difference between systemic versus pulmonary circuits uh, and the response to low O2. Again, low O2 is also known as hypoxia. Hypoxia related to low O2. Um, hypoxia is going to result in systemic blood vessels di dilating, opening up the blood vessels, as opposed to pulmonary blood vessels, which will constrict in order to divert that blood over to the areas that are more oxygenated. Again, we'll revisit that when we get into a respiratory lecture. So moving at that, let's take a little change of pace and start to tie in what we're going to be learning today in our lab.
to get, looking, uh, looking at circulation. So uh, circulation, when we look at peripheral circulation, we want to measure blood pressure, which is an indication of how, our, how much blood is flowing through the heart. And that's going to give us our systolic pressure as well as, as well as our diastolic pressures, knowing that that pressures resemble the uh, force of, or the pressure of blood being exerted during ventricular systole and during ventricular diastole when the heart is at rest. So we're going to be able to measure these pulses. And just kind of as a side note, how do we really, okay, I guess we can't directly measure, but another indirect measure, um, which is a better clinical tool for determining uh, how much blood flows to the heart or blood flows out of the heart, that's where you do an echocardiogram. It's basically ultrasound into that area. They can measure the diameter of the vessels of the aorta, and they can see the spurts of blood that's flowing through during systole and diastole. And from there, they can determine how much blood flow, which is a better accurate measure, as opposed to inferring blood flow through blood pressure. But blood pressure is the easiest clinical tool. It's the thing that you do for vitals uh, when, when a patient presents at a clinic. So in this case, what are we doing? We're measuring the differences in pressure. Uh, systolic and diastolic. But at the same time, we can also uh, derive the heart rate. And we do that by just measuring the pulse. And what exactly is the pulse? When you look at the, uh, the uh, blood that flows out of the aorta, that's where we're going to feel the strongest pulse. So if you have a way of sticking your hands into somebody's aorta, you'll feel the contraction, uh, or rather the, 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 the pulse of blood flowing through. And the further you move away, you'll notice that that pressure wave is a little bit smaller. If you were to measure somebody's pulse in their arm versus measuring their pulse by their foot, you'll notice that the pulse in the arm is stronger. And that pulse, again, is the pressure waves, the systolic and diastolic waves that are moving all the way through uh, down our elastic and distributing arteries. So with that, we can derive what our heart rate is by just measuring the pulse. So how do you do that? Well, you have your ways of doing it. Basically, you just count the number of beats that you're feeling whenever you're palpating the wrist or the, or the foot, um, and that will give you our heart rate. Uh, side note, why do we not want to measure heart rate by doing this? You probably see people measure their heart rates by measuring the carotid artery, right? You will feel their pulse and they can feel it and they'll measure it from there. Why do we not always do that? It's not the most appropriate clinical tool. Mainly because we have baroreceptors in there. And those baroreceptors in the carotid sinus, if you start to increase pressure in that area, that's going to decrease blood pressure. And therefore, decreasing blood pressure is going to decrease heart rate. So it's not our most accurate. So you want to do it in an area that's away from those baroreceptors, specifically by the wrist. Kind of the reason why, I guess, one of the reasons why you don't see nurses come in and just jab their finger right into somebody's throat to measure their heart rate. It's a little invasive, but not, again, not the most appropriate. So how do we measure our blood pressures? Well, you guys are going to learn how we actually do it, uh, the mechanisms to do it, but, or rather the, the procedure for measuring blood pressure, if you don't already know. But this is going to uh, explain the mechanism behind measuring circulation. It's one thing to know how to do blood pressures, but it's another thing to understand why or how we uh, derive blood pressures. Yes? So, like, um, right where we have patients that have, like, ventricular devices, they have no pulse. Like, do you know how that works? Like, why? Um, what is it again? They're, like, L-fan machines. Like, they have, like, they have a total artificial heart. Or they have like uh, a machine that pumps like the left yeah. ventricle move. Yeah. Yeah. It, it pumps it, it through the aorta, so, but they have no pulse. They're alive. They're walking. Uh, these are these, <laughs> so this is uh, this is continuous <laughs> blood flow, right? Yeah. I I've read about these. Um, really interesting thing about them. They're um, I think I hope we're talking about the same thing, but there, there's two kind. There's some where they have like they just have like total artificial heart. They have like yeah. a backpack that like, just makes the noise that's just pumping. Yeah. The tube. Yeah. You see them walking around. And the other ones just have a little device where it just helps the left side of the heart. Yeah. Um, I think we might be talking about the same thing, but I, I remember reading years ago about a guy who was uh, the first, uh, this is years ago, he was the first one to be tested with a continuous, um, continuous device. And so the way 
blood flows through the aorta is through spurts, again, systolic and systolic pressures above diastolic pressures. So if you ever watch any old movies and like somebody's neck gets cut, you see blood squirting out like that. That's exactly what blood, how blood flow works. You just get spurts over and over again, and those spurts are representative of heart, heart rate. Now, in those continuous devices, instead what they're doing is just a device that just generates um, the same output as cardiac output. It's like literally turning on a faucet and allowing continual flow of blood. You can still maintain blood pressure, but you're not getting the systolic versus diastolic. If you were to measure their, their, their pressures in their, air, in their arteries, there is no pulse. Why? Because you don't have the systolic waves. So check to see if those are the same people, because I don't remember too many people getting this continuous thing. And I think when I read it, they were doing research on it, thinking. It like when they're waiting to get a heart transplant. Them alive when yeah. Heart. yeah, exactly. That's, that's what they, they use, is, the, is uh, the, the, the machine that just basically allows continuous blood flow without using the pulse. So I don't remember, again, uh, I, I read this years ago, they were speculating, is there really any reason for those systolic waves? Is it, is it really necessary? Because by the time it makes its way to the capillaries, we lose the systolic versus diastolic waves. And at that point, all we really need is to make sure that we have enough blood pressure, enough hydrostatic pressure to enable fluid movement. So um, if you do find out, let me know the name of the machine. I can look it up. Be interesting. Okay. Left ventricular assistance device. Okay. So with that, <clears throat> thank you for sharing. But in normal people that don't have that have normal hearts, um, you have uh, the blood pressure um, that is measured. Here, what you would normally see again, 80 representing our diastolic pressures, 120 measuring the systolic peak that takes place during ventricular systole. So what we'd expect the pressures to look like would be this. These, the, these pressures. And as I mentioned earlier, you see where we spend most of the time? We spend most of the time in, in, in um, diastole, while a third of the time we're in systole. So what we want to do to measure pressures, we want to measure them specifically, and I'll just jump to the next slide real quick. We want to measure uh, right within the brachial artery, which is close to the aorta, same in uh, same level uh, with, with gravity. We want to be able to measure this. If we were to measure blood pressures in the leg, somehow if you were able to get a blood pressure down to the leg and measure it there, that wouldn't be the most accurate measure. Why? Because we have the effect of gravity. We have gravity pulling down on blood. Therefore, blood pressures would be lower in the foot. And if you were to get a blood pressure around somebody's neck, which I would not advise you guys to do, you would measure blood, blood pressure over there would be a little bit lower than that of the heart. So we want to measure somewhere close to the heart, which the brachial artery is the best, best area. And what we do is we hyperinflate the cuff. We're going to bring that pressure well above where we expect to find systolic pressures. So we inflate it to about, and, and typically you bring it up to about 180 about to 200. And once you get it up there, we're going to now occlude or block the brachial artery. So if I can just draw the brachial artery. Here's our cuff. The brachial artery is going to be completely occluded, completely blocked, preventing any blood flow through that area. At the same time, you're also going to have a stethoscope, and you're going to listen for any sounds downstream from the cuff. So you can place your stethoscope right below the brachial artery and listen for any sounds. Any, any sounds that you hear is blood moving. Well, specifically, it's going to be the sound of turbulence. So where do we start to see turbulence? Once we get to this point right here, we're going to start to lower that blood pressure, or uh, lower that cuff. And as we lower the pressure in that cuff, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. By the time we get to about systolic pressures, we open up, there's, a, there's less pressure, there's about a little less pressure in the cuff than there is systolic pressure. In other words, Systolic pressure, the, the, the pressure of that blood is just enough to be able to force blood through the most smallest opening because the pressure on the cuff is less. And therefore, blood starts squirting out just a little bit through. You get a little bit of, a, uh, of, of blood squirting out, and that's going to create sounds that you can hear. And these sounds are called Karotkov sounds. They're the sound of blood turbulence as it flows through the brachial artery. So now you start hearing sounds. And you're going to see that the sounds are going to sound different as you move from 120, from systolic, all the way to diastolic. 
And that means that during these pressures, in between 120 over 80, you still have that pressure on the cuff. And that, that pressure on the cuff is still going to uh, squeeze that brachial artery and still cause those turbulent sounds, which you're going to continue to hear, up to the point that we get to the diastolic pressures. So by the time we get just below the diastolic pressure, the pressure in the artery is higher, well higher than any of that exerted by the cuff. In other words, the cuff does not occlude the brachial artery anymore. And at any point, as long as, you're, uh, as, long as uh, blood is flowing through optimally, we get laminar flow. That means blood flows smoothly through the vessel. And therefore, no sounds will be heard. So everything from this point to this point is going to cause turbulence. So the emergence of the first sounds that we hear up to the point of the absence of any sounds is going to be representative of systolic pressures and diastolic pressures. So that's how it's going to work. So with that, we can get our measures of our systolic pressure versus diastolic pressure. And one of the things that we want to be able to see is being able to diagnose hypertension versus hypotension. And hypertension is basically a, a high blood pressure. It's a very common disorder that you, uh, that you would see. And it lends itself to many other diseases that can come out of it. So hypertension is not uh, necessarily a disease per se, but it's, it's a, a symptom or a disorder that can lend itself to other types of diseases that can take place as well. Because as you start to see, it'll start to cause a whole host of other things where uh, you have edema as, as, a, as an issue. Um, we can start to see the emergence of atherosclerotic vascular disease. If you have high blood pressure, right? think about high blood pressure, a high, dis, a high diastolic pressure means that the left ventricle has to pump higher than, let's say, 90 or even 100 diastolic pressure to be able to push blood out of the heart. So that's like saying, that's, that, that's, a, that's pressure being put on the left ventricle that has to, additional pressure that has to be overcome in order to eject blood out of the heart. So now you've got your heart working overtime to pump against that increased systemic resistance. And that could other, lend itself to other diseases like congestive heart failure. Um, that also imposes a lot of pressure on the kidneys as well. And therefore the kidney function starts to, starts to decrease over time. These are important. So where do we start to see where abnormal blood pressure takes place in, in, in the case of hypertension? Well, the way it's clinically set right now is normal is 120 over 80, and in women it's actually lower, which you'll be able to see on the next couple slides. Pre-hypertension has been labeled as 120 over 30, not 139, 120 to 139 over 80 to 89. Stage one hypertension, one above 140. Stage two, of that above 160 for systolic. So these are important to, to take a look at somebody's blood pressure. We want to bring that back to normal. So all this was derived. How did we come up with these numbers? It's not like we just threw some numbers up and just said, hey, let's just call this hypertension. Um, they've actually been able to uh, uh, perform a study, and I think I talked about this before, it's called a Framingham study, in which back in 1948 is when they started uh, to measure the life expectancy and mortality and all the health measures of people in Framingham, Massachusetts. And I forget how many people were there at the time, but they wanted to follow all the people from Framingham and not follow just that first generation, but the second generation and third generation. Well, I think it's one of the things that you have to, I guess, as a citizen of Framingham, Massachusetts, you're part of the study where they'll send you questionnaires about your diet, questionnaires about your history. They want to know all about you because that's going to tell us later down the line, what are these people, what could they possibly have died of? So with that, they were able to see people that had um, uh, uh, hypertension or at least higher systolic and diastolic pressures. They found that these were the people that were more susceptible to heart diseases, heart failure kidney disease. And with that, they were able to not only look at people with, their, with, with uh, their systolic and diastolic pressures, they also looked at age. So one of the things about the Framingham study, um, and, and I worked with uh, a professor at UCLA that, that looked at these numbers, and he found that the older we got, 
the higher their blood pressures came. So about, uh, about people about in their 40s, 30s and 40s found that they were so-called so prehypertensive. So he felt that age is just a normal factor as to why blood pressure would come up. So why was that important? Why did, why did researchers at this time say, well, this is prehypertension. You should start probably taking medications to bring it down. He felt that it might have been a pharmaceutical push to start labeling people that are prehypertensive to get them on drugs, to get them on, on uh, hypertensive drugs, anti-hypertensive drugs, to bring their blood pressures down when it could have been somewhat normal. But nonetheless, it's one guy versus all the people that were involved in this study, which is fairly huge. Dr uh, it drives, uh, it still currently drives uh, the reason for a uh, lot of the clinical decisions that are made today. Why is it bad to do exercise if you have a high hypertension? Um, because what we're doing at that point, uh, when, when you already have high blood pressure, when you start exercise, you you're already raising blood pressure as is. Also, oh, you're doubling it. Yeah. So typically what happens with exercise is you would actually expect your blood pressure to rise a little bit, and then it should actually normalize. People like to think that during exercise, your blood pressure raises really high. Um, and that is true to a certain degree, depending on the type of exercise, depending on also the type of type of exercise, whether you're and the intensity of it, whether you're doing like resistance training or you're doing uh, cardiovascular exercise. Cardiovascular exercise, your blood pressure stays roughly the same. It goes up a little bit, but we still maintain normal blood pressure. Now, resistance training, actually, you will see blood pressures rise quite a bit. So anybody that's doing some heavy squats, your blood pressures are raising up to about 300. But obviously, you're not maintaining a squat for that long. It's not like you're doing it for half a day or anything like that. But nonetheless, that's why it might be an issue because your blood pressures are raising high and then they're coming back low and higher and lower. And people that do have some form of heart disease of some kind, they just want to be monitored. We're not telling them not to do exercise. It's just be aware that you could faint or you could have um, any, any issues that come up. So typically those people you want to monitor. And even before that, you want to advise people that are prehypertensive to start getting on some sort of exercise regimen. You typically tell people, lose weight, do more exercise, and that'll usually bring it down quite a bit. And that's something that you also see with people that do exercise quite a bit, their blood pressures will drop. And that's because the heart's much more efficient, being able to pump blood, more, uh, pump blood out, and that will normalize blood pressure. So with that, the other thing that we'll look at is hypotension, where this is a lower blood pressure. And in, in hypotensive people, that if you if any women here with uh, low blood pressure, yeah. So when you probably go to the doctors, they tell they tell you your blood pressure is kind of low. Are you are you okay? Do you feel dizzy? Do you feel dizzy? And if you just report that you're normal, okay, then they can just accept this is your baseline. We expect your blood pressure to just be that, and if we see it drop any lower, then it might be a cause for concern. If it goes up a little higher, then I guess that would be more about normal. But nonetheless, if you're not reporting any symptoms of any kind, then I guess you're okay. So typically women, uh, especially smaller women, or, or, or not smaller, but uh, height deficient, I was trying to think of that if it's politically correct to say smaller women, but nonetheless, if uh, women, uh, women tend to have a tendency to have lower blood pressure. As long as that's okay, uh, and you don't have any uh, symptoms, you should be fine. But normally, hypotension, low blood pressure, clinical hypotension is gonna be a cause for concern, because that's gonna, again, relate to perfusion, blood flow, and fluid exchange with our organs. So we want to make sure that those organs are maintain, are getting the right amount of glucose and O2 and, and removing CO2 in order to make sure that that tissue is still functioning. Okay? We want to make sure that, uh, that there's enough blood flow to those areas to contribute to maintaining survivability. So with that, um, uh, there's some theories behind why women have lower blood pressure, and uh, there's some theories behind estrogen being a factor too, uh, that estrogen has a, a way of bringing down uh, blood pressure, because uh, they've done studies on women uh, that are postmenopausal, where estrogen drops quite a bit, and they found that their blood pressure comes back to normal after, high, uh, after menopause. And another thing too is they also look at the effect of testosterone. Testosterone has a tendency to raise blood pressure. So maybe that could be the reason why it's normal to have low blood pressure, but testosterone brings it back up. The last concept that we'll talk about in the next couple slides 
is the concept of shock. So all we've been talking about that have been leading up to this point is the extreme version <laughs> of where now we have extremely low blood pressure that would result in less perfusion of our tissue beds. And of those, uh, again, life-threatening, is due to that low blood perfusion, results in not enough oxygen to those tissues. And obviously that's, that can be a, a cause for concern because ischemia is, uh, or, or damage due to low O2 is, is, a, is a concern. So we have different ways in which we would have extreme blood pressure drop, of which we have four types. That first is hypovolemic, so a drastic drop in blood volume. So hypo being low, volemic being volume. We have a way of decreasing our blood volume. How do we do that? Blood loss. So somebody who's been in a, in, in a motor vehicle collision of some sort can have loss of blood, and that causes hypovolemic shock. So a de decrease in blood pressure can cause that. Dehydration is another way. Loss of fluid. Okay. Loss of fluid means loss of blood volume. Cardiogenic shock is related specifically to heart. And it's all related to poor heart function. How so? Well, ischemia of the heart, or myocardial infarction, which is heart attack can contribute to poor left ventricle ejection of blood. So LVEF, left ventricular injection fraction. Uh, looking at uh, cardi uh, congestive heart failure is another one. Obstructive shock basically means that there's some obstruction of some sort to blood flow, whether that happens in the heart or it happens in the vessels. Uh, typically, that could be pericarditis is another way. Again, an inflammation of the uh, pericardial layer over the heart. Any pericarditis would come in and create extra fluid that prevents the heart from fully expanding up to the limits of the pericardium. So because now that heart can't expand all the way, now that's going to be decreased blood flow. So it's an obstruction in that area. A pulmonary embolism can come in and interfere with the amount of blood flow back into the heart. So that interferes with the pulmonary circuit. Another way is uh, stenosis, aortic stenosis. This is blood flow out the aorta. And if you, you see, see narrowing of the aorta, again, obstruction of blood flow out into the systemic circuit. The last of these is distributive shock. Distributive shock is extreme vasodilation. And a good um, um, example of this is anaphylactic shock. You get somebody who is, uh, has an allergy to peanuts, and you're sitting there munching away at peanuts right next to them, and all of a sudden that person reports feeling their throat close up, and they're having this response where they can't breathe, and all of a sudden they pass out. What happens is they have a massive allergic response. It's a huge histamine response. Histamine is a vasodilator, and take that uh, with a systemic response, and all of a sudden, blood pressure drops dramatically, again, affecting perfusion of the critical tissues. So what do they do in those cases? They might have an EpiPen, which I, I don't know if the, I know EpiPens went up in price, like ridiculous, I don't know if they went back down or anything like that, but nonetheless, there are a lot of people out there that can experience anaphylactic shock and need to have an EpiPen in case of anaphylaxis. So I've never really understood uh, I never really understood why uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies could raise the, uh, the price of something like that, for especially in the case where this could cause death, but that's another topic. If you're at, U if you're at UCLA, you've probably seen the banners for sepsis. Take a look at sepsis. Why is sepsis important? This is an infection of the blood. Infection of the blood can cause, again, extreme vasodilation and can cause uh, imme immediate death if not identified. So at UCLA, they've got a bunch of factors, a lot of clinical metrics that they're looking at to see cases of sepsis. And obviously, if there is an infection, we want to prevent that infection uh, to anybody else because it does cause quite a bit of number of deaths at, at the hospital. 
So that's another thing to, to think about is, uh, and not even just sepsis, all the other diseases at hospitals too. It's crazy when, when, when you walk around hospitals and you, I remember when I first, uh, first worked there, I wondered why they kept you know, using stuff on their hands and wiping things down. And I thought, it's a little extreme. But no, there's a bunch of diseases at a hospital, MRSA, uh, C. diff, there's a bunch of them out there. And these are cases where people can come in just for a simple procedure and then walk out with something where they have an antibiotic resistant strain of some sort and end up, you know, dying or, or, or something else. That they, what was it, in the like, last couple of years, there was one hospital that caused like four deaths because something wasn't properly cleaned. What was the Huntington Hospital with the GI scopes? Yep. Oh, that was UCLA. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Huntington had that same issue. Yeah, the endoscopes. Yeah. It's our big thing. Yeah. Um, if any of you guys are ever interested, uh, epidemiology is always a cool uh, profession. And those are the ones that study diseases. And epidemiologists are the ones that are high. I mean, we actually have a small team at UCLA, but they're infection control people. So they like to look at cases and find uh, positive cases of any diseases. And they need to go around. They're investigators. And they try and trace where, uh, where, the, where the origin of that bacteria comes from. Or, or a virus or anything like that. So they take cases and they go through and they interview and they go case by case, look at who's met with who. Has anybody ever watched uh, Outbreak or Contagion or any of those movies? Uh, Contagion was a really good one. I think that was a more recent one where you had, uh, they were epidemiologists that want to study the diseases that, that came on board. Same people that also studied Ebola. And they trace where people have been exposed to and, and the pathways that have led to. And, uh, and, and all that. In fact, uh, uh, epidemiologists also get, um, if you ever work on a cruise line, they could hire you as an epidemiologist because if there's ever a case of food, uh, food poisoning, you've got the perfect case. You've got, let's say, I don't know how many people are on the cruise, 15,000 people, 1,500 people, 2,000, but you've got a closed scenario, you've got the same amount of food, and anybody that's food poisoning, you've got to go around and interview people and find out what did you eat at what time, what day, were you exposed to anything else? And they have to go around and interview everybody and take all that information and see, what patterns do we see here? Ah, it was all the potato salad at this time that was served by this person, and it all comes down to they didn't wash their hands. something just washing their hands. Chipotle, <laughs> Chipotle was a good example of that. There's only two places where that, that, that took place. I don't, I don't remember where, but they, it all ties down to, you gotta wash your hands. Did they get in trouble for that too? Not washing their hands, the bronchoscopes? That, that's what we were talking about. There was these uh, GI tubes that they were using, endoscopes that we were using, and uh, the question afterwards became whether it was related to the company that supplied them or was it uh, uh, practices at UCLA at the time. I don't know whatever came of it, but the, but the big thing, of course, that came out of it was you know, lawsuits. <laughs> so with that, that, I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but I, I, I remember um, in, in grad school when I took epidemiology, I was just like, I had kind of a heart for it. And I'm like, I wish I had gone into that because it just sounds so interesting. Um, now, looking at that, um, basically all of shock we already saw with hypotension or severe hypotension, we want to be able to respond accordingly by increasing sympathetic output to restore blood pressure. So we want, in, in essence, when it comes down to in cases of shock, we want to be able to provide adequate blood flow to our critical organs. So that's why I, uh, um, some of the symptoms that we'll be able to see. All the other mechanisms that we sought to auto-regulate to bring blood flow back by restoring, uh, by increasing cardiac output and increasing venous return are all different ways to maintain blood pressure. All of our renal pathways that are, uh, that are um, enacted in order to raise blood pressure work back up. This you'll see is, uh, and, and I might need to change these a little bit, but basically what it comes down to is shock with the initial drop in blood pressure, you'll see all the other responses that come back up. The first line, heart rate and uh, contractility force increase. You'll see these are heart responses. Uh, vasoconstriction, vasodilation are vessels. ADH and renin and aldosterone are all endocrine. AMP, again, cardiac, but still considered endocrine. So all of these are gonna be systemic run responses all across the board to make sure that we can maintain blood pressure. And as some of the organs fail, it's not uncommon for seeing people that are in shock. And when you get one organ to fail, if you get your kidneys to fail, you've lost a good mechanism 
actually uh, three good mechanisms in maintaining blood pressure. Kidneys start to fail, then, uh, then you'll start to see other mechanisms start to fail as well. So um, with that, it's not uncommon to see at, at, end of life, at the point of end of life for somebody, you'll see multiple organ failure. Uh, and then all of these right here basically uh, point out uh, what medications are used. Epinephrine is typically used to raise uh, blood pressure back up and then uh, or organ failure afterwards if that doesn't respond. So looking at the common symptoms of shock, uh, you should now be able to explain some of the symptoms that you would see if they were ever presented in a clinical arena. So pale, cool, clammy skin. Why would it look pale? Recall of fluids, right? get fluid being pulled away from the skin, it's going to look pale. It's going to be cool. Why? Again, because vasoconstriction is again going to redirect that blood away from, uh, from the tissue. Clammy. Why is it clammy? Well, these are the sympathetic effect. A, a bunch of catecholamines. You've got a bunch of epinephrine flowing through you. And that's going to override and cause it to be a little sweaty. Uh, and I guess the question, if, if any of you are uh, wondering why sweating, well, ADH it should come off and turn off sweating, but the amount of epinephrine that's flowing through your system at that point in time will cause more sweating than that of, that's being inhibited by ADH. Nausea and vomiting, typically due to low sodium, hyponatremia. Tachycardia should be self-explanatory. Weak pulse, again, self-explanatory. Increased respiration is due to all the Catecholamines, again, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine flowing through the circulatory system. Decreased uh, cardiac output, again, self-explanatory. Thirst is the increase in ADH. If you have increased ADH, increased antidiuretic hormone, that's going to drive the thirst centers in the medulla oblongata. You need to take in more water, so it's not uncommon that someone's tongue will look super dry. <coughs> Dilated pupils, again, a sympathetic response onto the radial muscles of the eye, causing uh, dilation of the pupils. Cyanosis of the lips and nail beds, another something that they're looking for. If you have people that present in a clinic that have pulmonary diseases, first thing they want to take a look at is their nail beds. Is it purple? That's going to give you an indication that there is uh, vasoconstrictions on the nail beds. Something that's also interesting, especially with people with COPD, look at the formation of the nail. It starts to create this sort of curved look to them. There you go, perfect. That's exactly what you would typically see. The, the uh, less blood flow to that area causes malformation of the nail bed. So these are things that are good indication. You can really start to see based on the symptoms what they could possibly do.